Someone's quiet sobs can be heard near the huge light dragon statue. A young girl addresses the great Artel kneeling in front of the statue. She was sure that she already knew everything, since she monitors everything that exists. The girl voices her problem and says that her father wants to marry her off. Her father also wanted her to stop practicing alchemy, then added that she would become an old maid because she was already 24. The girl's hands begin to tremble violently when she reports that her father is not going to wait any longer. She confidently raises her head, and a shiny tear runs down her cheek. The girl screams that she does not want this, not understanding why she should give up alchemy and why a young noble lady must get married. The Estain Empire was one of the strongest on the continent, and there was the O'Clain family, who had authority since the founding of the empire. Living up to the title of legendary alchemists, members of the O'Clain family showed great skill in alchemy, and they passed on this talent for many generations. Descendants naturally refined their skills in alchemy for the family business, allowing the O'Clain family to maintain its high reputation. Now the family owns the largest alchemical workshop on the continent. A man enters the workshop and everyone present immediately greets him. This was Hames O'Clain, a man many alchemists looked up to. He asked not to pay attention to him because he only came to see Rebecca. The man used alchemy to create various weapons, which helped the Empire increase its military power several times, so he was called the founder of weapons. Hames moves closer to the girl, who is diligently minding her business by the fire. He notices that she inherited too high a level of concentration from him. This man had a daughter, Rebecca, his most precious treasure. The girl notices her father in front of her when she takes off her work glasses. She asks what brought him here and if he is feeling well today, and the man reports that he has been feeling better in recent days. Hames tells his daughter that they need to discuss something, trying to be as stern as possible. Rebecca comments that this is great, since she was just planning on visiting him this evening, since this time she did something really impressive. She begins to say that at first she was working on an ointment for scars, but the man suddenly interrupts her story. He gently pats his daughter on the shoulders and addresses her by name. Hames asks her to stop, and the girl looks at him in surprise. She asks what's the matter, not understanding what the man wants from her. The father sharply says that he is talking about her alchemy studies. Rebecca asks what he means, and the man notices how quickly time flies because she is already 24. Suddenly, the girl asks if Judith said something, after which she assumes that it is all because she secretly read a book at the ball. She says that she didn't think that anyone would notice if she was reading in a small nook behind the curtains, after which she asks for forgiveness and promises to be more careful next time. The father says that this is not the case, after which he says that if she does not get married this year, she will remain an old maid. He says it's time to leave all this behind and get ready for the wedding. Suddenly, Rebecca screams that she doesn't want to get married right now. When Hames asks what she plans to do, the girl replies that she plans to continue working as an alchemist in the workshop as before. The man sharply asks if she really thinks William will allow her to do this. He says that the guy told him that he refuses to take care of the girl after her father leaves. Hames says he doesn't have a lot of personal property, so even if he gives it to his girlfriend, it won't be enough for her to live on her own. Rebecca says that even if she is poor, she still wants to do what she loves for the rest of her life. Suddenly, the man, raising his tone, asks his daughter to stop. He loudly declares that he has already made a promise to the girl's mother. Hames says he shouldn't have allowed her to even begin alchemy. The man asks her if she really thinks she can make a living from alchemy, then asks her to think about what she has done until today, forcing her to stop doing alchemy from now on and focus on the wedding for her own good. Rebecca continues to sit on her knees in front of the statue, trying to get what recently happened out of her head. She says she doesn't want to get married and also doesn't want to give up alchemy. The girl just wanted to live the same way as now, and wondered if she was intelligent only because she wanted such a thing. She reports that her father has not scolded her until now, but it seems that he always considered her a mediocre alchemist. Rebecca realizes that Artel knows the truth, and realizes that she is in fact a great alchemist. She says it all makes her feel conflicted, but she was going to stay strong. Now was not the time to create a very important item. The girl asks Artel if the time that the legendary O'Klein mentioned has come yet. She says that is why she will continue to uphold O'Klein's legacy and her pride as an alchemist. Rebecca asks Artel what she should do and whether she should run away from home. Sniffling and rubbing her eyes, she accidentally looks at the space not far from her. In front of the girl lies a blue-blue handkerchief which was not there before. 
She is very surprised by what happened and carefully lifts the fabric. The girl touched by this asks Artel if she gave her this item. Rebecca looks at the statue in surprise and realizes that this cannot be. She gently presses him to her, after which she inhales the scent of the scarf through her nose. It was incredibly fragrant and soft, and Rebecca didn't understand who could leave something like that. A guy pleased with himself silently walks towards the exit, smiling. A few hours before he visited the temple, he was heading towards a hall in which many people had gathered, mostly girls. The girls, when they heard approaching steps, immediately turned their attention to the door. They whispered to each other about the guy, anticipating a good meeting. Their joy knew no bounds, and each wanted to see the Duke in person. This guy, Carlisle Rovinster, finally comes into the room. He was one of the Dukes of the Estain Empire, as well as the first swordmaster to appear in the Empire in 500 years. In addition to these qualities, he also had a radiant, divine face. But what many girls liked most about him was his body. Someone from the crowd shouts that they would like to cuddle with this divine body at least once. The girls begin to whisper. Some talk about the guy's tall stature and others about his broad shoulders. Some of the girls even liked the fact that the black uniform looked perfect on him. The girls crowd around the Duke, and he realizes that now he cannot get through them. Carlisle frowns with displeasure, thereby causing even more emotion from the crowd of people. A girl slowly approaches the crowd and addresses the people gathered there. It was Haley Cartius who immediately began asking what the girls were doing. The crowd quickly turned their attention to the girl, who announced that his lordship had been summoned by the former emperor. She says girls shouldn't keep him in this room. The crowd begins to whisper angrily about Haley, expressing their displeasure. Someone says that the girl thinks he is her wife or something like that. Carlisle seizes the moment and, apologizing, goes in the direction he needs. Haley follows the departing duke without taking her eyes off. He turns around a little nervously to look at what's going on behind him. In addition to the sad girls, Haley glares at him with a terrifying gaze. There is an ominous smile on her face that does not promise anything good. Carlisle is scared by this look, so he decides to leave as soon as possible. He slowly walks towards the man sitting in front of him at the table. The guy greets the man opposite, but the man asks to leave all these formalities. The person sitting suggests getting straight to the point and not delaying. Suddenly, the man asks when the guy is going to get married. Carlisle calmly says that he has no such plans yet. The man, coughing, asks how he is supposed to settle down with the world if he is not going to settle down. The guy says sharply, apologizing in advance that according to his doctor, the only problem with the sitter is that he is too healthy for his age. The man asks to remain silent, explaining that when a person reaches that age, no one can say for sure what will happen to him tomorrow. He reveals that Carlisle's father was his closest friend and also the husband of his dear sister. My father was young then, but he gave his life to save the man on that battlefield. The sharply sitting man shouts that the guy is not listening to him, but Carlisle explains that he is a master of the sword. The man says that even if he has gone beyond human capabilities, he is still human. The man sitting says that the father was then worried about leaving his son at such a young age, and asked the man to attend the guy's wedding instead of him. Carlisle asks for forgiveness and says that he really hasn't met the lady he wants to marry yet. The man understands him since all the girls want to get him, and the guy is probably tired of it. He says that even if he continues to be patient with the guy, he will never see the end of it. Carlisle asks him for a little more time, and he will introduce her to the one he plans to marry in the very near future. The man asks why he is not ashamed, because he has said this countless times already. He stands up and gives an order that the guy must get married within this year. Carlisle looks at him worriedly, about to object, but the man says that if he does not do this, he will personally force him to enter into an arranged marriage. The guy, frowning, stands on the balcony, leaning on the railing. Someone approaches him and tells him that he looks rather gloomy. Carlisle is about to bow, but the guy who came asks him not to do so. It was Oberith Astein, the current emperor who was interested in what his father had told the guy. The duke thinks a little, not knowing how to answer this question. Carlisle reveals that the man wants him to get married within a year, Otherwise, he will force her into an arranged marriage. Oberith assumes that if his father is going to go that far, then his aunt has already given in to him. Ravenster understood that he must marry someday. And the person standing nearby confirms this, because it is impossible for the family tree to be interrupted like this. He says that in any case, it's actually time for him to settle down, because he's already 28. Oberith says that if he were in his place, he would start courting Haley because she is the most beautiful of all. 
but the guy says that he does not care about appearance. The emperor jokes that she is unlikely to allow him to marry any other girl, because she already behaves like his bride. Carlyle says it doesn't matter, and he has no intention of marrying Haley, and the guy remarks that it will be even more difficult if he turns House Karshus against him. The Duke says that it doesn't matter anymore, and then announces that he is leaving. Oberit immediately assumes that he is going to the temple, which was correct, because for the person leaving this is the most comfortable refuge in the whole world. Carlyle and the temple servants quietly greet each other. The guy walks into the room with the statue and suddenly freezes. He sees a young girl sitting on her knees in front of Artel. Tears welled up in her eyes and the guy remembered something. Once before, he had already met this girl, enthusiastically reading a book. He met her about ten years ago. That day he ran away from the girls chasing him. They frolicked and called to him while he hid behind a small tree. The guy hid quietly, trying not to give himself away as long as possible. Carlyle didn't understand why girls kept following him. He decided to hurry up and get out of that place, so he rushed to the opposite side of them. The guy looking around approaches the huge door, preparing to open it. He looks into the room and sees a small storage room in front of him. This was a great place for Carlyle to hide. Suddenly, he notices a girl not far from him, sitting in a corner reading a book. He looks at her in surprise, previously not expecting to meet anyone in the room. The girl turns the page, still not distracted from the book. At one point, she finally turns around, noticing someone's presence. She notices a guy in front of her and squeals sharply in surprise. The girl assumes that he came into the room looking for her. Carlyle shakes his head and raises his hands, indicating that he was not involved in anything. She glares at him angrily, suspecting that he is lying. Hearing the guy's answer, she smiles and says that then there are no complaints against him. Carlyle becomes very embarrassed and his heart begins to beat faster. He was afraid of the girl's reaction, but realized that he was not the only one who had thought of going into the pantry. The guy looks at a girl unfamiliar to him, but realizes that she's again immersed in reading. She showed with all her appearance that she did not care about the world around her because she was too busy. Carlyle just looked at her, not making a single sound. He didn't understand whether he should leave now or what he should do if the girl suddenly tried to attack him like the others. Suddenly, scratching her forehead with her pen, she mutters something about the formula. Carlyle realizes that the girl is reading a book during the party. Even his little sister was so excited to come that she spent hours preparing. The guy carefully looks at her book and realizes that she is reading alchemy. The girl sharply asks out loud, sadly, why she can't understand. He coughs on purpose, trying to attract her attention. Not noticing any reaction, he coughs very loudly, which this time works. The girl looks at him questioningly, turning around, and he points to a certain part in the book. He says that the girl misunderstood her, and she nods. She begins to stare intently at the book, trying to catch the gist. Suddenly, she lifts the book up, thereby scaring Carlyle. She says that she has decided it, after which she thanks the person sitting next to her. The guy looks at her confusedly while his heart is ready to jump out of his chest. And now, being already an adult, he is still embarrassed, looking at the concentrated girl. This was the first time that someone had no interest in him. He didn't even know if the girl understood who he really was. Suddenly, Carlyle assumes that she is a member of the O'Clane family, since she is interested in alchemy and has red hair. He hoped that she, like him, did not like high society events. Despite how much time had passed, the guy still thought she was cute. This may have been the first time he didn't hate it. The guy listens as Rebecca asks Artel why a noble lady must get married. He looks at her and realizes that the girl has not changed, although almost ten years have passed. Rebecca covers her face with her hands and begins to cry from hopelessness. Carlyle frowns when he sees this, so he decides to take some action. He quietly approaches her and puts his blue handkerchief on the floor. The girl removes her hands and sees the fabric in front of her, surprised at what happened. She looks around while he contentedly walks towards the exit, still remaining unnoticed. Carlyle confidently walks towards his mother, Edelgate Rovenster. The woman turns around and sees her son in front of her. The guy bows to her in greeting when he sees that she has noticed his presence. She says that he looks better than she expected, because she thought that her brother placed an imperial decree on him right away. Carlyle replies that technically he did, and his mother asks why he looks like that then. He asks what he should even look like, and Adelgate looks at him questioningly. She wants to say something, but the guy suddenly interrupts her. Carlyle asks what the woman thinks about the O'Clan family. Adelgate says they are a family with a long history dating back to the founding of the Estane Empire, and the first O'Clan was a legendary alchemist. 
She continues that the former head of the house, Hames O'Clain, made a huge contribution to the development of their empire. The woman sharply says that Hames, as far as she remembered, has a daughter. Carlyle coughs, drawing her attention to him, before confirming the woman's words. The guy suddenly announces that he wants to send her a marriage proposal. The O'Clain family sits patiently at a small table, not making a single sound. There is a sound at the door and one of the men allows the knocker to enter. Rebecca looks in uncertainly, at the same time asking why they wanted to see her. She sees silent people in front of her, surrounded by complete darkness. The girl does not understand what is happening, but realizes that it is something serious. William O'Clain and his wife Judith were not the only ones in the room. In addition to them, their father and younger brother Locke were also present. Suddenly, William hands the girl an envelope, saying that she has received a marriage proposal. She doesn't understand what's wrong with his expression if he wants to marry her off and thereby get rid of her all this time. Rebecca, mentally turning to Artel, asks if she really has no choice but to give up, stop practicing alchemy and get married. Suddenly the girl notices that the sender of the letter is Duke Rovenster. Rebecca slowly steps out of the carriage, dressed in a beautiful pink dress. She is very surprised when she sees the building in front of her that she was about to enter. The Duke's estate was on a completely different level. The stranger tells the girl that Rovenster is waiting for her in the reception area, after which he tells her where to go. Rebecca couldn't stop shaking and it was very unnerving. She had not worn such a chic dress for a long time, which made her feel uncomfortable. The employees, bowing slightly, open the doors for the girl. As soon as Rebecca walks in, a guy greets her by calling her by her full name. Carlyle, standing courageously in front of the girl, introduces himself. She greets the man in front and, approaching him, stumbles. Carlyle asks her to sit down, telling her that he has prepared tea and that he really hopes that she will like it. The girl says that she likes tea, after which she assumes that he is pretending that he didn't see anything, which was quite nice of him. Rebecca is shaking with fear. She is very tense because of the current situation. The person sitting opposite observes her behavior, smiling slightly. Suddenly, he asks if the girl was surprised when he suddenly sent her a marriage proposal. The girl, nervous, says that she was very surprised. She awkwardly says that she means that, of course, she doesn't deserve a great man like him. Rovenster suddenly begins to laugh. He cannot contain his smile. He asks for forgiveness, realizing that he can't just tell her that in the past she completely ignored him to read a book. Rebecca says that she doesn't think she's worthy of accepting such an offer from him. Suddenly, Carlyle, trying to be as honest as possible, says that he is not going to marry her. The girl looks at him, dumbfounded, while he quietly sips his tea. She jumps up from the table and asks why he sent this proposal. Rebecca starts screaming at the guy, clearly not expecting to hear something like that from him. She remembered Judith telling her that it was like discovering a gold mine, and now she could marry into the royal family. William obliged the girl to accept the proposal no matter what. They said that if Rebecca rejected the offer, she would no longer be part of their family. The girl's eyes began to water when she thought about how much William and Judith had pressed her about this. Suddenly she remembers that Carlyle was looking at her all this time. She sits down, trying to figure out what she wanted to say, and Rovenster tells her that she has the right to say whatever she wants. He reveals that the reason for his proposal is that they are in the same boat. Rebecca apologizes and asks again what the guy said, not understanding where he was going with this. Suddenly, he asks if people are pressuring her to get married. He adds, without waiting for an answer, that the same thing happens to him. Suddenly, the girl asks if his mother died too, but he says that in his case, it is the former emperor. Carlyle says he's in a bit of a predicament, because he doesn't want to get married anytime soon. And what's worse is that the man he's up against is the former emperor of an entire nation. Rebecca says that if it's already hard enough for her to go against her family, it must be much harder for him. Rovenster smiles, seeing understanding from the side opposite her. The guy says that the fact is that after he received the order from His Majesty to get married, he felt quite confused, and therefore visited the Artel Temple. Rebecca suddenly understands what the guy is leading to now. The girl asks in shock if he heard everything that day. He agrees and says that this is how he found out about the girl's situation. Rebecca asks if he was the one who gave her the handkerchief and receives agreement, which the guy explains by saying that he can easily hide his presence due to the fact that he is a swordmaster. He admits that he didn't mean to eavesdrop, until the girl realizes that this is not what Carlyle's skills are needed for. Suddenly, the guy becomes more serious again and continues his speech. The guy says that, in his thoughts, perhaps their meeting was part of Artel's will. 
The girl sits in shock, greatly surprised by this thought. Carlisle looks at her kindly, giving the girl time to digest the information. Rebecca continues to look at the guy in surprise, waiting for the dialogue to continue. Suddenly, Rovenster asks what the girl would say about entering into a contractual engagement with him. She looks at him in shock, not ready to hear something like that from him. Rebecca asks the person sitting opposite him if he just said about the arranged engagement, not believing her ears. She wonders if Carlisle means that he wants them to pretend to be engaged. He says that the engagement usually lasts from three months to two years, after which he expresses his desire that he wants to be in a contractual relationship for two years. The girl, trying to paraphrase the guy's proposal, asks if he wants to avoid pressure by arranging a fictitious engagement, after which she receives confirmation. Suddenly, she says that she doesn't think this is a good idea. After two years, they will break off their engagement, and people will pressure them again and again, so this is nothing more than a way to delay the inevitable. Carlyle says that she noticed it correctly, but everything will be completely different in two years. He explains that he mentioned earlier that he received orders from the former emperor. According to him, in two years, he will not be able to order the guy anything, including forcing him into an arranged marriage. Suddenly, the girl asks if he means the hatching tradition. To her surprise, Carlyle immediately confirms her guess. The hatching tradition is a tradition that can only be found in the imperial family of the Astain Empire, as the first ruler was the son of the great dragon, Arthel, who was incredibly worried when her son took the throne. So she stayed in the imperial capital to watch over him and everyone by his children. She remains the guardian of the empire to this day, and in honor of her motherly love, the imperial family created the tradition of hatching. This is the time when the abdicated emperor provides assistance during the reign of the newly crowned emperor. With this tradition, the former emperor retains some of his imperial power, so it is impossible not to carry out his orders. The guy says that everything will end in two years, since he will completely renounce his power and spend the rest of his days in the former imperial palace in the south. The girl asks whether the current emperor will put pressure on him to marry, and receives a denial, because Carlyle understood that he could not risk being on bad terms with the swordmaster because of such a trifle as marriage. Robinster says that if they proceed with their arranged engagement, he will ask the girl to stay here under the pretext of wedding lessons. The girl is scared by his words, but the guy promises that his family will be aware of their agreement, so she has nothing to worry about. He says that while officially, she will receive wedding lessons from his mother, but in reality, she will be free to do whatever she wants. Unexpectedly, Carlyle promises that he will turn one of the outbuildings into a personal workshop for her. The girl slowly tries to digest the information he said. She is suddenly very surprised that this workshop will be her personal one. For Rebecca, this was an incredibly tempting offer. The guy adds that after the engagement is broken, he will sponsor her for the rest of her life. She asks in surprise what he means, not understanding what he's talking about. Carlyle says that he will prepare a place of residence for her, as well as provide her with all the facilities and equipment necessary for her alchemical research and then gives her the choice of which city to live in, promising to take care of her financial well-being forever. The girl looks at him in surprise when she hears the last word. He says that if she wishes, he will invest money in a large workshop for her. Rebecca warns that she cannot create things of any value, such as weapons. Rovenster says it's okay because his family has a lot of money, and he also has more than enough personal money. She, touched by his words, says that he must truly hate marriage. Rebecca, almost sparkling, looks with admiration at the man sitting opposite her. The guy says that everything he just said will be included in the contract, and he promises that none of it will be changed or cancelled. Rebecca, still sparkling, confidently says that she believes every word he says. Suddenly, she becomes gloomy and prepares to say something important. She says she is immensely grateful for his offer for now, but asks him to give her some time to think things over. Carlyle agrees and says that she can think as long as she needs and can come as soon as she makes a decision. He says his offer letter bought them some time anyway. Robinster, smiling, looks straight into the eyes of the sitting girl opposite. Rebecca carefully walks into her home and is immediately greeted by familiar voices. Judith and Hames instantly come running, asking how it went. The girl, unable to withstand this pressure, runs away, saying that she will tell them everything tomorrow. They shout after her that she must share all the news now. Rebecca slams doors loudly and locks herself in her room. Her heart is beating wildly, her eyes darting anxiously around her surroundings as she tries to catch her breath. 
Her father comes to see her, addressing her by name with some concern in his voice. The man says that he knows that it must be difficult for her, after which he reports that Locke was also terribly worried about her. Hames knew that all this was really weighing on the girl, considering that she immediately hurried to her room instead of going to the workshop. Suddenly the man asks her if Rovenster is really a great person. Rebecca says that Carlyle is too wonderful for someone like her. Hames replies that becoming a duchess will entail many responsibilities, but she will also be able to enjoy many privileges, and there truly is no better family to marry into in their empire, as the Rovensters have been very friendly to them for many generations. The girl mentally understood that she would not actually get married, because instead she would sign a contract. It was a deal to deceive her entire family and all of Estaine. A man reports that he saw the girl's mother in a dream last night, and she asked if her daughter was happy. Hames woke up that day unable to answer the question. He says that the girl's mother, Cordelia, went through many hardships due to the fact that she was a noblewoman without an official title. The man promises that when she visits his dream again, he will definitely tell her with pride that their daughter will become a duchess. Having said these words, Hames goes to the door and asks the girl to rest. He closes the door behind him, slamming the door a little, and leaves Rebecca alone. The girl, plunging into anxiety more and more, asks herself the question of what she should do. After a short amount of time, Rebecca decides that practicing alchemy is the best way to clear her head, so she heads to the workshop. She opens the creaking doors of the workshop and is immediately greeted by familiar voices. Two trembling guys stand in front of her and she asks what happened to them. The girl looks at them in amazement, suspecting that something bad has happened. Suddenly, Rebecca rushes to the side that the guys have been trying to block all this time. Suddenly, she sees that her seat is empty, so she quickly asks what happened to her table. She asks them a question about why there is nothing at her workplace, and the guys begin to tremble even more. One of them admits that William yesterday told them to remove the girl's things, because, as he said, the girl no longer needs them because she is getting married. Rebecca, also starting to shake slightly, asks what happened to her data. The guys finish off the girl by saying that William threw away absolutely everything that day. She, trembling with despair and anger, shouts the name of her older brother throughout the workshop. The guy sits in his office, sorting through the accumulated papers. He never imagined that his sister would marry a duke, but it was wonderful. Suddenly, the growing sound of footsteps is heard from behind the guy's door. Rebecca angrily bursts into the room, hitting the door with all her might. She nervously asks why he got rid of her desk in the workshop. And where did her invention data go? Rebecca slams the table, asking where the guy threw them. William irritably asks what she thinks the girl is doing now. She says that's exactly what she wanted to ask her brother. William gets up from the table and tells her that there is a limit to her arrogance that he will tolerate. Unexpectedly, he says that now he is the head of the O'Clain family and she must show respect. The girl, without backing down from her point of view, asks why the guy cleared her table. He, Seeing people whispering behind the door became even more angry because Rebecca dared to humiliate him in front of all the servants. William asks how her father raised her and what her problem is. The guy tells her that she will get married soon and now is the time to give up her childhood dreams. He asks if she really imagined that she could become an alchemist. William yells at her that everything she has ever created is just useless garbage. He says the only reason she had her own little table in the workshop was because of their father. Rebecca says Hames has nothing to do with this since she took the test like everyone else. The guy reports that she has never created anything useful and then asks who could call her an alchemist. Suddenly, Rebecca asks what he himself could create then. She reminds him that he is only in his place because he is a son. William, twitching a little with anger, asks the girl not to classify him as like her. He says that all she does is idiotic experiments, after which the girl asks what he wants her to do then suggesting that it could be the Philosopher's Stone, which only the legendary O'Clain could create. The guy reports that he is not an idiot, mired in the dream of solving the riddle left by their ancestor, and he strives for real success, like his father. Hearing this, Rebecca asks if he means developing weapons, and then reminds him that he has failed dozens of attempts. He asks how the girl found out about this, and she says that he squandered all their family wealth. After this, Rebecca asks how he has the audacity to criticize her abilities as an alchemist. She turns around, not allowing the guy to finish, and then says that he helped her understand that she doesn't need to think about all this anymore. William, not understanding anything, asks her what she meant. 
Rebecca announces that she is going to get engaged to Duke Rovenster because she has a feeling that from now on she will not regret any of her decisions. The girl leaves while William hopes that she is not thinking of leaving their family after the wedding. The guy thought that everything was in order, because as soon as he married her, the girl would not be able to live like an alchemist, no matter how hard she tried. Suddenly, Rebecca runs into her father's room, wanting to see him now. Haim, standing near the bookshelves, asks his daughter what happened. The girl throws herself into her father's arms, telling him that he got rid of her father in the workshop. She nuzzles into his chest, and he gently hugs her as she tells him that William threw away all of her collected data and inventions. Haim suddenly asks if the girl was going to give it up anyway, then says there's no need to be upset about it. The man says that she will soon get married, and now her data and inventions will not be useful. He sharply adds that William's actions were not correct, because he ultimately threw her things away without permission. The man says that since this has already happened, she should make the most of it, because now she can focus on her wedding lessons and engagement. Rebecca starts to say something, but is suddenly interrupted by her father's cough. When he finishes coughing, the girl looks at him seriously. She asks if she weren't his daughter and part of the O'Clain family, would she even be accepted into the workshop? Hames wants to object, but again feels a little suffocated. He starts coughing loudly again, and this time his daughter runs up to him, worried. The man tells her not to be angry, then asks if it matters whether she is an alchemist or not. He tries to reassure her that she will still always be his precious daughter. Rebecca mentally asks her father if there was ever a single moment when he truly recognized her as an alchemist. Images of the strict and cold William and Judith pop up in the girl's head. After them, worried Hayes and Locke appear before her eyes. At this moment, Rebecca realizes that in fact there was not a single person who considered her an alchemist until today. The girl decides that she will nevertheless enter into an engagement contract, after which she swears that she will make sure that her family and everyone else see her as a real alchemist. Carlyle, sitting behind some papers, asks who came. His servant says that Rebecca O'Clain has come to him, and the guy is surprised that she came so early. Servants near Ravenster whisper about whether he really intends to get engaged to Rebecca, since he has always had a strong aversion to women. The girl sits calmly behind a chair, waiting for Carlyle to arrive. She turns slowly and notices a familiar silhouette in front of her. The guy smiles warmly at her, noticing her gaze on him. He slowly approaches her and wishes the girl good morning, after which he sits down opposite her. Rebecca apologizes for coming so early, but the guy says that this is quite normal. Suddenly, seeing the tired eyes opposite the woman sitting, he asks if something happened. The girl excitedly replies that everything is fine and she only had trouble sleeping last night. Carlyle asks if the girl had breakfast, to which she replies that she had no appetite. He says that he also didn't have breakfast, after which he offers to have breakfast together and calls the butler. Ravenster, going straight to the point, suggests that the girl came to him because she had already made a decision. Rebecca agrees and confidently says that she accepts his proposal to enter into an engagement agreement. Carlyle asks why she decided to accept him, explaining his interest by saying that last time she seemed a little hesitant, which made him think it would take longer to decide. She prepares to answer, but breakfast is unexpectedly brought, causing her to delay her answer a little. The Duke shows her the soup prepared by their chef, famous even in the capital, and then asks her to try it. The girl eats the breakfast prepared for her with a huge appetite. Carlyle watches her eat and smiles involuntarily. A servant standing not far from them notices that Ravenster had already had breakfast a little earlier. Unexpectedly, Carlyle says that as long as their agreement is valid, he will consider her his man. He adds that even if it's a fake engagement, he promises to treat her with the utmost respect. The girl thanks him, after which she promises to do the same. She says sharply that she's not sure how much she can tell the guy about her situation. The Duke asks her not to be shy about saying whatever she wants, after which he informs her that he does not mind if she even scolds. Rebecca jumps up and says that she would not dare to say such words in front of his lordship. Carlyle, asking her to sit down, asks how about calling each other by their first names. He says that they have a lot in common, because they both do not want to participate in high society and want other things to be a priority. Rebecca confirms his words, and then says that after he put it that way, she will no longer hesitate. The Duke again asks what really made the girl make a decision so quickly. She, a little embarrassed, tells him everything that happened to her earlier. After the girl finishes her story, they sit in awkward silence for a short time. 
Ravenster looks at her in surprise, and she says that since childhood she dreamed of becoming an alchemist. She says that after she followed her father into the workshop for the first time, she couldn't imagine being anything else. While other young ladies took etiquette classes and learned how to arrange bouquets and embroider, she stayed with her father to practice alchemy. At 15, she took the exam like everyone else, getting a perfect score, which gave her her own little desk in the workshop, which she considered a privilege that she got for getting the highest score. Then she thought that everyone in the workshop and in her family recognized her as an alchemist. And from that day until yesterday, she never knew the truth. Until now, no one had ever really seen her as an alchemist. She asks if Carlyle also thinks that she is nothing more than a joke, and he immediately confidently replies in the negative. He says that she is the most passionate and hardworking alchemist in the world, and the girl is surprised by his confidence. Ravenster smiles sincerely at her when he sees that questioning look. Suddenly, he says that he is so confident because of the girl's hands. He says these hands are proof of all her efforts. The guy reports that the scar on his index finger looks like it came from a small cut with a knife, which the girl confirms. The Duke adds that she also has a scar from a minor burn nearby and a fairly large wound on her thumb. But most importantly, she has accumulated a lot of calluses. Rebecca asks in surprise how he saw all this, and he replies that this is his ability as a swordmaster. She says that it is probably difficult to believe that these are the hands of a noble girl, after which she says that her daughter-in-law scolded her more than once for this. Carlyle snaps back that he doesn't think anything like that should be criticized, because it's a sign of her hard work. Rebecca's face, touched by his words, begins to well up with tears. She asks the guy for forgiveness and gently rubs her eyes with her hand. Suddenly, the Duke takes out a white handkerchief from his pocket. He hands it to the girl and then asks if she will accept his second scarf. Rebecca accepts the cloth and thanks the person sitting across from her. She reports that this has given her a strong resolve, after which she vows that she will force her family to recognize her as an alchemist, and the guy hands her the contract. The girl carefully reads every line of the contract. Carlyle, meanwhile, thinks about how someone could call her dreams childish when she strives so hard for it. Unexpectedly, he says that when he first picked up a sword, his teacher said that he had never seen a child with a worse stance in his entire life. This surprises the girl, because at the moment the Duke is the greatest swordmaster in the Empire. Carlyle reveals that this is all because he kept working hard and never gave up. The guy says that those who give their all to what they love and don't let ridicule and criticism get in the way of them always succeed. He adds that this is why he is confident that a day will come when the girl's efforts will also be rewarded. Rebecca joyfully thanks the person sitting opposite her, after which, without hesitating for a second, she puts her signature on the contract. Carlyle's younger sister, Charlotte Rovenster, asks if he really just said about the contractual engagement. Adelgate says that she heard right, after which she says that she really doesn't know who he is following as an example, making such stupid decisions, while Charlotte thinks that he is taking an example from his mother. Carlyle's mother reports that her brother, the former emperor, probably already knows everything about this scheme. Charlotte sharply says that she's afraid for the lady because she will not get anything from this. She adds that if the lady breaks off the engagement after two years, it will be almost impossible for her to marry anyone else. Adelgate confirms her daughter's words, saying it makes sense. The mother asks if this is too disastrous a proposal for a noble lady, after which Charlotte says that he must find another way. The girl asks the guy not to sit there as if this is not his problem at all. Carlyle suddenly says that the contract has already been signed. Charlotte tries to say something, calling Rebecca a weird lady, but the guy interrupts her, not understanding why the lady is called that. The girl explains that eccentric lady is her nickname in high society. She asks that even if it is Rebecca of all people, how would any lady agree to this? Carlyle gets up from the table and says that they will understand everything when they meet Rebecca herself. Adelgate sharply says that the fact that the guy's cheek is fine means that the lady is a very patient and kind girl. Suddenly, Charlotte suggests that everything is just the opposite and this lady is deceiving Carlyle. She abruptly begins to list all the times her brother has had different girls try to woo him. The girl asks what the guy is going to do, and Carlyle says that he will invite Rebecca to dinner in a few days. He announces that he will formally introduce the girl to the two of them. The guy, leaving his mother and sister, thinks that Rebecca is not like that. He was truly grateful that the girl had not changed at all since he last saw her many years ago. Carlyle, thinking about all this, lifts the corners of his lips slightly. 
The girls, gathered in one place, discuss among themselves the news that the Duke is going to get engaged. They say that he was almost everyone's favorite to be shared, but now only one will have him exclusively for herself. Suddenly, they hear a rumor that Rovenster is going to get engaged to an eccentric lady. Someone asks if this is the girl who doesn't know how to wear dresses, never follows trends, and the girl who got scolded for secretly reading a book at the ball. One of the girls reports that both families have already officially made a statement. Suddenly, the topic turns to Haley Cartius, who is about to get engaged to the Duke. They imagined how upset the girl was, if even they were incredibly disappointed. Haley stands quietly by the window, outside of which it is pouring heavily, without uttering a single word. A man comes into the room asking what happened since she doesn't even come out of her room. He looks at her in surprise, seemingly standing calmly in front of the window. The girl is silent for some time, not paying attention to the presence of her father in the room. Suddenly she asks if he has already heard about the news. The girl reveals that Carlisle is going to get engaged, but to Rebecca, not her. She says that of all people, this is the strange lady of high society. Harshly, Haley declares that Lady Rebecca stole the Duke from her. The man suggests that the former emperor put pressure on the guy, but the girl still doesn't understand why Rebecca and not her. Haley's father says that this is most likely just part of Carlyle's plan, and he is clearly trying to buy time before the hatching tradition expires. The girl says that she can't accept it anyway, and then asks her father if he knows what a laughing stock she has become. The father reports that he asked Adelgate several times, but she wants to leave the decision entirely up to her son. Haley abruptly says that her father should break off their engagement. The man, slightly lowering his head, says that it is not in his power. He explains that the O'Claines have been on good terms with their family for many generations, and they are very helpful. But suddenly, the girl says that they are only a puny earldom. Father says that they cannot be compared with other houses of this rank, and it would not even be surprising if they were elevated to the rank of Marquis or Duke right this second. He adds that the O'Clain family produces all the weapons of the Empire, and they improve and repair everything as well. Haley sharply says that the O'Clain's magical weapons and tools are nothing without Cartsia's certification, but the man sharply replies that their house has as much influence in the Empire as they do. He says they can't act recklessly, but the girl abruptly interrupts him. She asks if he means that she has no choice but to let this woman take Carlisle from her. The man asks if it must be Carlisle, after which he promises that if she wishes, he can make her become the queen of the kingdom. But the girl immediately rejects this offer. He says that if she wants to live her life in peace, then she needs him, since only he can protect her. The man asks if the girl really hasn't gotten over what happened earlier, and Haley accuses him of being like that. The girl says that if he feels regret for everything, then he must do everything possible so that she gets the duke. She also adds that if she suddenly had to take it into her own hands, she has no idea what would happen in the end. Haley turns back to the window, ending her dialogue with the man. Her anger that Rebecca dared to try to separate Carlisle from the girl was incredibly great. The girl, feeling strong tension, carefully enters the gate. She nervously makes a small bow to the people in front. Rebecca introduces herself and says she's honored to meet them. Charlotte and Adelgate greet the girl friendly, asking her not to be nervous. They say they just wanted to see her face at least once before the engagement ceremony and get to know the girl better. Suddenly, Adelgate says that Rebecca deserves an apology. She adds that she was told that the girl also needs this betrothal contract, but even so, such a deal would be disastrous for any noble lady. The woman says she would like to apologize on behalf of her son. Suddenly, Rebecca asks why this contract is harmful. Adelgate and Charlotte look at her questioningly, very surprised by her reaction. The woman apparently understands something and begins to look at the girl more surprised. She harshly says that she doesn't need to protect Carlisle like that. Suddenly, Rebecca says that she doesn't understand something. She asks Adelgate for forgiveness for this, which again surprises the woman. Adelgate says she shouldn't apologize for this and Charlotta confirms her words. The woman asks if Rebecca is really sure that she agrees to an arranged engagement. The girl says that she needs it as much as Carlisle himself. After this, she suddenly asks if those standing opposite also agree. The girls look at each other, smiling kindly. Adelgate says she has no doubts as long as Rebecca and Carlisle are okay. Charlotte approaches the girl and grabs her hands, asking her to feel freer and call her simply by her name. She says that the guy told her that she wants to continue doing alchemy. 
Rebecca confirms this and shyly asks if the girls allow her to do this, and Charlotte agrees, asking to show her too if she does anything interesting. Charlotte admits that she recently read a book about a magical lighthouse, which pleasantly surprises the girl. Both glow with joy, realizing that they were able to find a common language. Carlyle slowly approaches, joining their company. He greets the girls, which enlivens the atmosphere even more. Soon, the whole friendly team starts drinking tea, diluting it with friendly conversations. The meeting comes to an end, and Rebecca says goodbye to her new acquaintances. Adelgate gives her a friendly wave while Charlotte simply smiles after her. The girl leaves in a carriage, and the girls decide to exchange opinions with each other about their time spent. Charlotte says that Rebecca is definitely different from other noble girls, then remarks that it was easy to tell what she was thinking. Adelgate notes that she was polite, but she did not seem accustomed to the manners of high society. Charlotte comments that she liked the fact that she didn't have to be nervous around Rebecca. The woman says that she really seems unusual, but she liked her. Unexpectedly, the girl says that her dress and makeup didn't really suit Rebecca. Adelgate offers to lend a helping hand to the girl for the engagement ceremony. Carlyle, meanwhile, looks thoughtfully after the departing carriage without uttering a single word. Several days pass and the day of the engagement ceremony arrives. Rebecca was finally going to get engaged on this day and it made her nervous. She thought everyone looked gorgeous after the Rovenster family said they would take care of all the preparations and expenses. Despite this, she was confused by the fact that although Judith was happy that they were able to save money, she would definitely spend it on a new dress. Suddenly, Charlotte calls out to the girl and they both say hello. Charlotte notices that she came dressed up, and Rebecca says that despite her objections, her daughter-in-law continued to insist. The girl looks at the person standing opposite her and says that there is a style that would suit her much better, after which she takes her hand and pulls her along. Carlyle adjusts his suit, noting that it is terribly uncomfortable. Luckily, he knew he just had to be patient for today. Light footsteps are heard, and the elegant Rebecca comes down the stairs. She smiles all this time to the guy looking at her, greeting him. Carlyle looks at the woman descending in shock, without taking his eyes off. He says her name questioningly, not believing his eyes at all. The Duke says that he almost didn't recognize her, because now she seems to be a completely different person. Rebecca chuckles and asks if his words are a compliment. The guy realizes that he made a mistake while Charlotte glares at him. He asks for forgiveness and agrees, explaining that he was very surprised, so he could not find the right words. Rebecca remembers that she too was shocked when she saw herself in the mirror. At that moment she realized that she really looked a lot like her mother. The girl wondered whether her mother would have supported her decision if she had been alive. Carlyle suddenly takes the hand opposite the one standing and gently kisses it. Rebecca looks at him in surprise, clearly not expecting something like this. Charlotte, watching all this, shudders from what she sees. She was incredibly surprised that her brother had just kissed Rebecca's hand. Carlyle comes to his senses and is very surprised, not understanding what he just did and whether it was too much. Rebecca decides that he must be used to this, since he has always been popular with the girls. The guy offers to go, since all the guests have been waiting for them for a long time. The girl, slightly worried, takes Carlyle's hand and they head into the hall. Guests peacefully communicate with each other while waiting for the ceremony to begin. Haim says he was a little disappointed when they wanted a small celebration just for close family. Afterwards, he adds that, nevertheless, it is still a wonderful engagement ceremony. He also notices that the Rovensters put in a lot of effort, and someone suddenly asks if they promised that the wedding would be even grander. The registrar announces that they are proceeding with the engagement ceremony. As he makes his speech, Judith remarks that Rebecca's dress and jewelry must cost a fortune. Hames approaches Edelgate and says that he hopes she will take good care of Rebecca from now on. The woman promises that she will definitely make sure that she is comfortable. She, meanwhile, couldn't believe that she should feel guilty for her son's actions. The girl, scattering flower petals from her basket, congratulates her on her engagement. Carlyle looks sternly into the distance while Rebecca, smiling, watches those around her. Suddenly, William approaches them, addressing his sister. He congratulates her on her engagement and apologizes for what happened in the workshop. Rebecca turns, knowing that he's unlikely to be truly sorry, and also deciding that she won't feel guilty about her actions either. She sees Locke not far from her and remembers what happened earlier. That day, the guy handed his sister a folder with documents, asking her to keep it a secret from William. He informed her that these were her data and creations, which he secretly hid away. Rebecca then happily thanked her beret for his actions. 
He then apologized for being a bad big brother because he couldn't even stop William. The girl didn't understand what he was talking about and reminded him that he was the best big brother. Locke put his hands on his sister's shoulders and then said that he had always thought of her as an amazing alchemist. That day, he asked her not to give up, while tears were increasingly welling up on the girl's surprised face. Suddenly, Judith approaches Rebecca, laughing sarcastically. Suddenly, she asked to never forget that all this was only thanks to her. Rebecca turns her attention to her father, who also decided to congratulate her on her engagement. She sincerely thanks him for his congratulations, smiling kindly. The man says that he really hopes that Carlisle will take good care of his daughter, to which the guy promises him that he will make the girl happy. Carlisle and Rebecca step aside, and the guy suddenly leans towards the girl, after which he whispers that everything was so fussy earlier that he couldn't tell her something. He reports that the annex has finally been completely converted into her workshop. The girl asks if the workshop is hers, and he agrees. She looks at the Duke, sparkling with incredibly strong happiness. Suddenly, Carlisle decides to change the subject slightly, preparing to make another promise. He says that Rebecca will not regret agreeing to this contract. The girl looks in surprise at the person standing opposite, a little embarrassed. Rebecca paces nervously around the room, waiting for the Duke to arrive. Suddenly, the girl is called out by Rosaline, her personal maid. She says that if the girl continues to walk like this, it will be difficult to clean because of all the dust. Rebecca reports that the guy is late, but Rosaline assures her that he will be there soon, because he probably has a lot to take care of. Unexpectedly, the maid notices that everything is different at the Duke's estate. She says that the room is filled with only the highest quality items that can be found, and that the Rovenster estate is as stunning as the Imperial Palace turns out to be true. Rebecca tilts her head slightly, surprised, and asks if the girl really thinks so. There is a quiet knock, and Carlyle silently peeks into the room. He asks the girl if she likes her room, and she agrees. She looks with admiration at the person standing opposite, sparkling with happiness. The Duke looks back at her, smiling slightly, a slight blush appearing on his face. Suddenly, he notices that he constantly finds himself smiling whenever he is with Rebecca, even though he never had any reason to be so happy in the past. He says he kept the girl waiting too long, so he suggests they go now. Along the way, Carlyle reveals that he has converted an outbuilding near the estate into her workshop, and the workshop may be smaller, but he sincerely believes that she will find the outbuilding quite suitable. The girl sees the building in front of her, and a strong surprise appears on her face. Suddenly, she realizes that this building is not a workshop at all, and Carlyle confirms her thoughts, explaining that he left the exterior decoration as it was. Rebecca recalled that he said it was an outbuilding, but she thought it was more like a small mansion. She assumed that he simply renovated one of the rooms. The door opens in front of the girl and she looks in amazement at what is inside. She sees in front of her a luxurious workshop that she could never have dreamed of before. Rebecca, still in a state of shock, does not believe her eyes at all. She asks if this whole place is really her workshop and receives a positive answer. The girl asks again if this magnificent spacious workshop belongs to her, and the Duke asks if she likes it. She runs up to the Duke and says that not a single alchemist in the whole world would refuse such a workshop. Rebecca, sparkling with happiness, examines everything in the room. She examines every detail with curiosity, leaving nothing out of sight. Carlyle, watching the girl's reaction, involuntarily begins to smile. He says he has made sure to stock the place with only the latest and highest quality products. Suddenly, Rebecca says that she now understands why the ladies are so obsessed with him. The guy mentally notes that she doesn't even want to dignify him with a glance. Rosalind, who had been secretly watching them all this time, did not understand how Rovenster knew what exactly the girl preferred. She wondered if this would be the right thing to do, since Rebecca was sure to go crazy soon, but she knew that she was already an adult, so she should be okay. The girl opens her eyes and sees an unfamiliar ceiling in front of her, after which she remembers that she is now living with the Rovensters. She thought that she would not be able to sleep in the new environment, but she actually slept like a rock because the bed was very comfortable. Rebecca decided that she had to wait a few more hours before she could go to the workshop, since she had woken up too early. Suddenly, she remembers that she now has her own workshop. She realizes that she no longer has to wait for O'Clain's workshop to open, so she immediately heads towards the building. Rosaline asked the girl to wait, saying that she expected her to do this. The maid suddenly takes out the girl's new work clothes. Rebecca looks at the clothes with admiration, surprised at the surprise. She says that her uniform is very cute 
and Rosaline remarks that she never cared about her pretty dresses. The girl notices that her clothes have a lot of pockets, which makes her incredibly happy. She hugs Rosaline, saying that she loves her, but the latter replies that she needs to direct that love to someone else. Rebecca puts on her new uniform and decides it's time to go to the workshop. The maid offers her breakfast, but she leaves this matter for later. The girl rushes along a huge corridor and notices the Duke in front of her. He looks at her questioningly, not understanding why there is such a rush. Rebecca calls his name without slowing down. She quickly says hello, not allowing the guy to wish her good morning. Carlisle asks what the rush is, and she says she's going to the workshop. She says goodbye and quickly runs away without saying another word. The guy was glad that she really liked it all, but he was a little disappointed. Rebecca rushes into her workshop, abruptly opening the doors in front of her. She looks around the building from the inside, completely covered in luxury. The girl still couldn't believe that now all this belonged to her. Adelgate tells his maid that one part of the order needs to be fixed in a certain way. Unexpectedly, she asks the person standing opposite her how Rebecca is doing. The maid reports that the girl was in her workshop almost all this time, adding that she is not entirely sure about this. What amazes Adelgate is that even the head maid did not know what was really happening these days. The woman begins to be very worried that the girl has not left her workshop all this time. Adelgate meets Rosaline and then asks how Rebecca is doing. The woman assumes that she is scared because of the move, so she asks her not to worry. She begins to say that she would like to be comfortable, but is suddenly interrupted. Suddenly, Rosaline, almost screaming, asks the woman to stop Rebecca. Rosaline enters the girl's workshop, reporting that Adelgate has come to see her. Rebecca doesn't react at all, but just continues to mutter something without looking up from her work. The maid constantly calls the girl, trying to distract her, but this does not end with success. Suddenly, Adelgate angrily shouts the girl's name, which greatly frightens her. The woman says that she now understands why Rebecca's maid asked her for help. Adelgate sharply says that the girl needs to be reprimanded for her behavior. She says she understands that she is passionate and serious about alchemy, but this behavior is unacceptable. The woman says that even Carlyle, who has ascended beyond human capabilities, still eats and sleeps. Adelgate notices how the girl's face has fallen and then says that her mother would be upset if she saw her like this. Suddenly, Rebecca asks if the woman knows about her mother. Adelgate says that almost everyone in high society knows about her. The girl, touched by the words opposite the one standing, looks at her with hope. The woman says that even if it is a contractual engagement, she is still her son's fiancé. She reveals that until the contract ends, she will consider her one of her people, as well as part of their family. Adelgate says that from now on, Rosaline, if the girl ever skips a meal or refuses to sleep, will have to immediately report this to the head maid. The woman adds that the head maid will have to get Rebecca out of the workshop, even if she has to call all the maids to do it. Suddenly, the girl says that she just needs to work a little more. The woman announces that if she continues to be stubborn, she will completely ban her from entering the workshop. Rebecca, shocked by her words, looks at the woman standing opposite her with her mouth open. Suddenly, Rosaline takes the girl away to eat and get some sleep, trying to avoid the woman's approaching anger. Adelgate looks displeasedly after those leaving, digesting everything that just happened. She says that Rebecca's head is really only filled with thoughts of alchemy. The woman remembers that Carlyle also used to neglect taking care of himself when he was engrossed in his sword training. She supposed there was no way to help determine people like them. The Duke approaches Rebecca, saying that he has already heard everything from Charlotte, after which he notices that she finally wanted to eat. The girl denies this, explaining the situation by saying that Adelgate scolded her, obliging her to also eat the entire snack. Carlyle says that if she doesn't want his mother to scold her, he can talk to her. Rebecca snaps that Adelgate reminded her of her late mother. She reports that the feeling was quite pleasant. Suddenly, Carlyle says that he has come to deliver bad news. He takes out an envelope and says that they have received an invitation to the Crown Prince's birthday. A couple of days pass, and a celebration begins in honor of the Crown Prince's birthday. The girls talk among themselves about how they will finally be able to see Rebecca. They assume she thought quite highly of herself now that she was the fiancé of the Duke of Rovenster. Suddenly, they announce that in a couple of seconds, Rebecca and Carlyle will enter the hall. They slowly walk in as Carlyle gently holds the girl's hand. The girls begin to whisper, surprised at how eccentric the lady looks. They compare her to a diamond in the rough, amazed that there was such a girl in high society. Carlyle and Rebecca take turns wishing His Highness a happy birthday. The boy thanks the guests, but some discontent is visible on his face. 
His Majesty congratulates them on their engagement, and they bow and thank him. Ravenster, surprised by such a short dialogue, asks if they can go. The guy calmly tells them they can go while his brother looks for his toys. His Majesty notices that Carlisle and Rebecca look better together than he expected. The two of them leave the hall together, occasionally exchanging short phrases. Carlisle glances slightly worriedly at the girl walking next to him. Rebecca is thinking deeply about something, which is why she does not pay attention to everything that is happening nearby. Suddenly the guy asks in a whisper if she is feeling well. She says everything is fine and he asks if anything is upsetting her. The guy is interested in why she is so careful in her speech. Suddenly, Rebecca asks him to stop talking so much. She says she tries to say only what is necessary to avoid making any mistakes. The girl says that when Charlotte and Adelgate chose a dress for her, she tried to find a metaphor to explain how much she liked it, but the girls laughed. The guy asks her not to pay attention to his younger sister. She says that Adelgate also said that she is quite a funny lady, and Carlisle explains that she said it as a compliment after which the girl says that other people will not be the same. Carlisle sums it up and asks if the girl was quiet because she was afraid of saying something wrong. Rebecca says that if she makes a mistake, it will reflect badly on their family. She adds that she doesn't want to cause him any inconvenience. Carlisle thanks her for her concern, after which he says that he does not want the girl to bother, because so far everything is in order, after which he offers to finish as soon as possible and leave. The two of them enter His Majesty's room, greeting him. The man congratulates them on their engagement and asks if they liked his gift. Rebecca does not understand what they are talking about, and Carlisle explains to her in a whisper that they were given a villa in the South. The man is surprised that he only told Rebecca about this now. The girl thanks him, and he says that it is just a small engagement gift. His Majesty asks the guy to bring him a glass of wine, as he felt a little dry in his throat. Carlisle calmly leaves to get some wine, saying that he will be back soon. Rebecca is confused by the fact that the man asked Carlisle about this and did not call the servant. The man invites her to get some fresh air and chat and she agrees. The girls, seeing Rebecca walking with his majesty, decide that it would be nice to improve relations with the O'Clain family. After a couple of minutes, they finally find themselves on the street. Suddenly, the man turns to the girl, breaking their awkward silence. Suddenly, he asks what kind of relationship he and Carlisle are on. He says that he already knows that this is all a performance, which greatly surprises the girl. The man says they shouldn't worry because he expected Carlisle to do something to get out of this. His Majesty says that what he did not expect is that the girl decided to take part in this. He says he was quite surprised to see them together today, then asks if they had known each other before, which Rebecca denies. The girl says that as he probably knows, she almost never participated in social events. She says that the day she went to the Rovensters after receiving the offer letter was their first meeting. His Majesty thinks that Carlyle seemed very fond of the girl, which is very unlike him. The man tells the girl that he has never seen Carlyle look at a girl for so long, and also never seen him smile so comfortably. Suddenly he assumes that they really are lovers. The girl completely denies His Majesty's assumption, which makes him think. Suddenly he says that he hopes she will take good care of Carlyle. Rebecca at first does not understand what he is talking about, but then agrees. Suddenly, Carlyle approaches, asking the man not to torture his fiancée. The guy stands with two glasses of wine in his hands, looking seriously at the two of them. The Duke explains that he walked for so long by saying that he had to find the only wine that His Majesty drinks and also find them in the garden. The man thanks him for the wine and leaves, saying he needs to get some rest. Carlyle, smiling, offers a second glass of wine to the surprise girl. His Majesty looks at them one last time, smiling slightly. He imagined that something might blossom in Carlyle's heart very soon. When the man leaves, the Duke asks the girl what he said to her during his absence. Rebecca says that he has already realized that their engagement is a sham. The guy, hearing these words, is very surprised, and clearly seems to fall into confusion. The two of them leisurely dance a waltz, while simultaneously discussing recent events. Carlyle tells the girl not to worry about the man breaking off the engagement, explaining that he already expected this. Rebecca is very surprised, almost shouting to the whole room, which attracts the attention of the other guests. She asks if he is sure that everything is in order, to which she receives consent. Everyone around them stares at them, trying to eavesdrop on the conversation. Carlyle says that everyone is looking at them like a pack of hungry wolves, and the girl asks if it's because she's a bad dancer. Rebecca says it feels like they're ready to pounce on them as soon as their dance is over. The Duke tells her not to worry, saying that he will sacrifice himself to protect her. 
The girl smiling asks if this is really true. Receiving confirmation, Rebecca smiles very widely, starting something bad. She suddenly runs away, saying that she leaves everything that follows to Carlisle. The Duke is immediately attacked by a crowd of girls while Rebecca happily runs away. She, without looking back, runs towards the first door she comes across, which surprises those around her. The girl sits down on the sofa, wanting to get some rest due to extreme fatigue. Suddenly, a small group of unfamiliar girls appears in front of her. One of them asks if the girl will read the book here again, to which she receives a denial. Rebecca says that she can no longer do this kind of thing, because now she is the Duke's fiancé. Her mind remembers the moment when Charlotte asked the girl in such situations to remind people that she was her brother's fiancé. Suddenly, one of the girls says that she refuses to accept Rebecca as his lordship's bride. They ask if the girl really thinks she deserves a duke. Rebecca says it's up to her and Carlisle to decide, and whether the girls accept it or not is none of her business. Suddenly, Haley appears somewhere behind her, asking what all the commotion is about. She says that it turns out that this is where all the stars of the celebration were. Haley adds that it is not surprising that the ballroom was so dark, since all the brightest flowers of the Empire were hidden in this place. One of the girls says that they just need to talk to Rebecca a little. Haley asks if the girls have a right to complain about all this, then asks the group to leave them alone for a minute. A crowd of girls leaves, muttering something under their breath with displeasure. Rebecca swallows the lump that has formed in her throat, already knowing what awaits her next. Haley looks mockingly at the girls standing opposite her. They both greet each other politely, bowing slightly. Charlotte's words pop up in Rebecca's head that it is Haley who poses the greatest danger, since she is very obsessed with her brother. Haley, suddenly looking very gloomy, says that she wants to give the girl some advice. The girl looks in surprise at the person standing opposite, not understanding anything. Suddenly, Haley demands that the girl call off their engagement to the Duke. Rebecca is very surprised by the girl's desire, not understanding why she should do this. Haley coldly tells her that she thought the girl would be smart since she was an alchemist, but she turned out to be the stupidest creature she had ever seen. Rebecca perceives the word standing opposite her as quite rude, but the girl says that she is the only one speaking rudely here. Haley says she stole her position to which she has no right. She whispers that Carlyle was always hers from the very beginning. The girl adds that this guy was born to protect her. Rebecca says that Carlyle is not property that a girl can have. Haley says she should listen to her while she's still polite. Suddenly, Rebecca says that she is not afraid of the girl. The girl standing opposite looks at her questioningly and her expression becomes even more aggressive. Rebecca adds that she has no power, so she is wasting her precious time giving her this stupid advice. She says that all she can do for now is wait until she leaves Carlisle. After these words, Haley goes berserk, getting angrier and angrier. Rebecca asks her if she loves Carlisle or just wants to own him. She asks if it will even matter if she does everything to get him. Charlotte suddenly appears asking Haley to stop all this. Rebecca looks at her friend in shock, not expecting to see her now. Charlotte, dissatisfied with the girl's behavior, looks angrily in her direction. Haley says that she is the reason she can hold her head high among the other nobles, and if she received help, then she should be able to repay the kindness. After which the girl mutters that kneeling right now won't be enough. Rebecca, shocked by the girl's words, asks if she really is that kind of person. Haley says that the people of House Rovenster take her kindness for granted, and Charlotte reports that she did not ask for any help so the girl most likely gave it in order to win her brother's favor. Suddenly, Haley asks if the girl wants to go back to the days when she was mocked as a widow who didn't even have her wedding night. Charlotte says she doesn't care and abruptly picks up Rebecca and drags her towards the exit. They leave, leaving a disgruntled Haley standing alone. Rebecca calls her friend's name, but she doesn't react. Charlotte, tightly clutching the girl's hand, continues to lead her somewhere down the street. Soon she finally stops and Rebecca asks if the girl is okay. Charlotte calls her by name, wanting to say something. She says that all this is true and one day she actually married the son of the Marquis of Lonarun. The girl reveals that Haley was true and she really is a widow. When she got married after their wedding ceremony, that accident happened. Then they were tired from a long day and planned to rest. Suddenly, a killer burst into the room, targeting her husband. Perhaps the killer did not want her brother to pursue him because he is a swordmaster because he did not touch the girl herself. At that time, the Marquis had many enemies. He was not a bad person, but he had ambitions, so he was at enmity with many houses in order to gain power. After that night, the Marquis did not want to let her go, and Charlotte's family sued him to have the marriage annulled. In the end, 
Her family won and she returned home, but during the process, their families began to feud with each other. The Marquis left the capital with great resentment towards the girl, and most likely this was because his son was killed while she survived. Rebecca, having listened to her friend's story, tells her that it is not her fault, and Charlotte smiles at her friendly. She said that the girl was right, but it was still impossible to stop people from shunning her and calling her a widow, causing her to become an outcast in high society. Carlyle then told her that she was free to marry someone else as soon as she recovered. He also said that she didn't have to get married at all if she didn't want to, because then he would take care of her. That day it was a good support for the girl, and she smiled and thanked her brother. Charlotte knew now that she didn't want to burden Carlyle, and she wanted to be good at something just like Rebecca. A friend of hers approaches the girl and offers to return because they shouldn't have stayed in such a place. Rebecca invites the girl to go home right now. Charlotte instantly agreed with her proposal, smiling. The girl walks slowly through the grass among the trees when suddenly she hears a strange rustling. Then she hears a voice, which is why she begins to look around and look for the source of the noise. Suddenly she hears the voice again and realizes that it is above her. Charlotte looks up and sees her friend hanging from a tree above her. Rebecca says that the girl scared her, to which the second responds in kind. Charlotte nervously asks what she was doing in that tree. The girl holds out a golden, shiny, spherical object. Rebecca says it's a weapon-type magical tool. She says that he is supposed to fly and attack enemies on his own, but she can't get him to fly properly. Charlotte asks in surprise how the girl could climb the tree. The answer is that alchemists must be able to get anywhere in order to collect the necessary materials. Charlotte asks if the girl also trained to gather materials on her own, and Rebecca shares that she has completed a course in basic strength training. She adds that she even asked her father to let her learn to swim and climb when she suddenly came to her senses and realized that she should not have told this. Rebecca asks the girl not to tell anyone about what she saw, because otherwise she will definitely be scolded. Charlotte agrees and in return invites her to drink tea in the greenhouse. She asks if there was another girl there, and Rebecca looks at her in surprise. Charlotte says that this is the pride of the Rovenster family because she is not just huge and all the previous duchesses took care of her. She was about to go with Rebecca into the greenhouse, but she stopped abruptly. The girl notices that Adelgate has already managed to get ahead of them. The maid warns the girls that a woman is now resting in the greenhouse. Charlotte says she'll show her around the greenhouse next time then, and Rebecca asks if the three of them could have tea. The girl guessed that her brother did not tell her, so she explains that there is a rule in their house that must be strictly followed. She asks if Rebecca already knows that her mom is sick. Charlotte says that Adelgate does not like to show her condition, so from time to time she goes off to relax alone, and soon there is a rule not to disturb Adelgate when she is relaxing in the greenhouse. The girl also tells her about her hope that she too will follow this rule. Charlotte says their greenhouse is quite famous, she reveals that they hold tea parties there when the roses are in bloom. Before she leaves, Rebecca takes another look at the greenhouse, thinking about something. The girl's invention flies into the greenhouse itself, and from there it begins to smoke heavily. Rebecca quickly runs in the right direction, not knowing what to do. She was told to be responsible just yesterday, and she was already in trouble, so she promised herself that she would never make another magical weapon again. She remembers Carlyle telling her that monsters were continuing to attack the northern border. For this reason, he had to leave for a while, but he did not intend to stay there for long. That day, he asked the girl to take care of the Rovenster estate during his absence. Then Rebecca gladly agreed and said that Carlyle could rely on her. The girl opens the doors, mentally asking the Duke for forgiveness. She couldn't believe that she had made such a huge mess while the guy was away. The girl sees Adelgate in front of her, holding her smoking invention in her hands. Rebecca looks at the woman in fear, realizing what she has just done. Adelgate notices the girl and sighs slightly in surprise. They stand almost opposite each other and are simply silent for a while. Suddenly, Rebecca screams that she is very sorry and rushes to the exit. She runs away, leaving the woman to no longer understand what just happened here. Adelgate sits in front of the mirror and quietly gets ready for the day ahead. She asks her maid to help her get ready, and she calmly agrees. The maid asks which wig the girl will choose today, and Adelgate asks for the lightest one. The servant carefully places a gray wig on the woman's head. Adelgate says she needs to invest in a wig business because they shouldn't be so uncomfortable and heavy. The maid says that all her wigs are made from real human hair, making them look the most natural, to which the woman replies that this is their only positive quality. Adelgate asks to call Rebecca to discuss yesterday. 
The maid suddenly tells the woman that the girl is already waiting for her. Rebecca had been waiting all this time for the woman to finally wake up. Adelgate opens the door and the girl jumps up nervous. She immediately apologizes for coming early in the morning. The woman calmly says that the girl shouldn't be so nervous. She says that nothing can remain a secret forever, and the girl would find out someday. Adelgate says that several years ago she started having heart problems. Fortunately, her illness was completely cured, however. In the process, she lost all her hair, so she felt quite insecure because there was a reputation that she had to maintain. She says this is the reason why she has not attended social events for some time. Suddenly, Rebecca decides to talk about why she really came. She is very nervous, but Adelgate reacts calmly. Rebecca hands her the vial, saying that she wanted to give it to her all along. She says that she prepared it to express her regret, then says that she really hopes that she will accept it. Adelgate asks what it is, suggesting it is medicine. The girl says that this is a potion for hair growth, which greatly surprises the woman. Rebecca asks if this has offended her in any way. Adelgate persistently asks the girl to say that phrase again. The girl says that it is a potion created through alchemy that makes hair grow faster. Suddenly, the woman says that such a potion simply cannot exist because otherwise it would be a miracle. Adelgate hesitantly asks if she was really able to make this potion. Rebecca reveals that she was originally working on a potion for scars, but ended up doing it by accident, and then reveals that she has already tested whether the potion works and whether there are any side effects. The woman asks her if she's sure, and Rebecca says that if she doesn't need it, she'll take the potion back. Adelgate does not refuse the potion and asks the girl to slow down. She asks how to use the potion, then suggests that it needs to be drunk, and Rebecca reveals that it needs to be applied to the skin. The maid runs away, saying that she will prepare everything immediately. Adelgate seriously asks if she can trust the girl's words. Rebecca confidently continues to say that the potion really works. The girl says that her hair may grow longer than she expects, which makes Adelgate laugh. The woman can barely hold back a small giggle at first, but it soon turns into laughter. The maid comes up and says that she has everything ready. Adelgate turns to Rebecca, wanting to tell her something. She takes off her wig and asks if the girl would like to start using the potion herself. Rebecca agrees and they immediately get to work. The woman, sharing her impressions, says that something sticky was smeared on her head. The girl reports that now all that remains is to wash everything off. Adelgate thinks until the last moment that there is no potion for hair growth, and at that moment blonde strands appear on her head. Rebecca reports that everything is ready, admiring the result. Adelgate looks at the girls in surprise, not believing that it really worked. The woman looks at her hair in bewilderment, still not believing it. She touches her hair, trying to come to reality. Adelgate suddenly decides that Rebecca is a real miracle. Carlisle returns home late at night and is greeted by his footman. He asks if he should now prepare everything for rest, and the Duke says that he should not rush. The guy assumes that everyone is already in the bedrooms, but the footman informs him that his mother is still awake in the living room. Carlisle is very surprised by the guy's words, feeling some excitement. The guy immediately goes to the living room, after which, approaching the desired room, he carefully knocks on the door. He enters the room and, bowing, announces his return. Adelgate congratulates him on his return, suggesting that the guy is tired. Carlyle notices his mother's hair and asks if she dyed it. The woman suddenly says that Rebecca is truly an amazing girl. The guy doesn't understand what he's talking about, so he's very surprised by such words from his mother. Adelgate again says that Rebecca is absolutely incredible. The woman tells Rebecca that she would like to sincerely thank her. She adds that she gave her back her life and the girl says that she is overpraised. Adelgate asks how long the effect lasts and the woman sitting opposite says that it lasts about 10 days. The woman is very happy with the answer because it took much longer than she expected. The girl asks her not to worry because she will make more potions before the effect ends. Adelgate says she couldn't be happier than she is now after hearing this. She reports that Hames was a great alchemist and her brother was very sad to hear the news of his passing. The woman says that it's incredibly wonderful that Haim's daughter turned out to be such a great alchemist. Adelgate is interested in why the girl's talents are still not known to the whole world. Rebecca asks not to flatter her so much because, according to her, she doesn't deserve all these blows because of a failed project. The woman says that this is not a failed project, but something amazing. Adelgate reports that this is the best potion she has ever seen in her entire life. Rebecca says that from an alchemical point of view, it is not even a magical tool, but just a rather banal thing. The woman asks if the girl feels like she is putting herself down too much, 
and the second confesses that she has always been told that her creations are useless. Adelgate angrily asks what exceptional fool would utter such nonsense. The girl reveals that this is what her father and older brother say, and the woman clears her throat nervously upon hearing this. Adelgate sharply says that her dream's father-in-law will hold a pretty high bar, being a genius. The woman again repeats to the girl that she has done something incredible, and that this is a dream potion. Rebecca says that this is not even a magic weapon, and then begins to compare it with the Philosopher's Stone. Adelgate says that the girl is an alchemist, and she is not, so their values may differ. She says that a general preparing for war would naturally want more magical weapons. A poor man who does not even have money for food will naturally desire the Philosopher's Stone, which can create gold from anything. Adelgate says she doesn't need either one or the other. Absolutely none of it. The only thing she wanted was to get her hair back again. She ends up saying that this is why, to her, her potion is the most valuable and useful thing. Adelgate says she is confident that others will agree with her. Rebecca sheds a few tears, touched by the woman's speech. Carlyle coughs on purpose to draw attention to himself and Charlotte. He does this again when he sees that there is no reaction from them. Charlotte asks if those talking have forgotten that she and Carlyle are here too. Adelgate tells them to just quickly start eating breakfast. Carlyle nervously sips his drink while Rebecca tries to figure out what's going on. Charlotte tells the woman that she should have said that her illness was completely cured. She says they had no idea all this time, so they were very worried about her. Adelgate says it was for their sake, as people would probably make fun of the two of them if they knew she was bald. Charlotte still insists on her own, not attaching importance to her mother's words. Adelgate still apologizes to her children, adding that she has something important to discuss today. Charlotte begins to get even angrier, and Carlyle tries to calm her down. The woman again says that Rebecca created an incredible potion. Adelgate says that after they finish breakfast, they will discuss the business plan for commercializing the potion. Rebecca flinches slightly when she hears this, but doesn't immediately understand what she's talking about. She, very surprised by this idea, asks what they will do. Carlyle asks his mother what she means. Adelgate says it would be a shame if she was the only one who knew about the potion. The woman offers to release the potion on the market, guaranteeing that it will be in great demand. Rebecca says she doubts anyone will want to buy her product. Adelgate confidently asks the girl to take her word for it. She says that this potion will change the lives of many people on their continent. Charlotte joins the conversation and assumes that people will be willing to pay any price to buy it, and Rebecca asks if she really thinks so too. The girl asks to call her by her nickname Char, offering to be friends. Rebecca asks if Charlotte also thinks her potion has value. The girl says that if she were bald, she could kill to get her hands on such a potion. Adelgate adds that the potion will be an absolute success. Rebecca suddenly asks if Carlyle feels the same way. The guy looks at her in surprise, not expecting to hear such a question in his direction. He asks if she was serious about just keeping it for herself. The girl says that she is not sure, and Adelgate reports that she simply must sell it. Charlotte says that this potion should not be known only to her mother. They decide that the potion should be mass-produced, and also think that they will need an alchemy workshop. If they entrusted it to a trading company or guild, they would require a large fee from them. So they decided that the best option was to start their own. They ask if the girl has anything else to sell, but when she says no, they don't really believe her words. After that, they demand that Rebecca show them everything she has. The girl gets up from the table, still not understanding what is happening. Charlotte and Adelgate laugh evilly, already anticipating a successful business. Carlyle, who has been watching all this the whole time, asks if anyone is even going to have breakfast. Several days pass, and Adelgate says that she wants to introduce someone to the girl. She introduces her to their family lawyer named Tyler. The woman says that if they have any legal problems setting up their business, he will take care of them. She also shows Rebecca the manager of their company. Olsen. The girl gets a little scared, after which she greets the second one. Olsen suddenly says that she has created a truly magnificent potion. He takes off his headdress and says that the fact is that he also lost his hair. The man excitedly asks what the name of her potion is. Rebecca says she just listed it as a hair growth product. They decide to call the potion Rebecca's Hair Growth Remedy and decide to use the girl's name in the name of the brand. The girl, very nervous, asks if they are really going to sell this potion. Adelgate confidently agrees without hesitation for a second. The woman says that now she is not afraid to tell the truth. Adelgate says that she will tell everyone that the girl helped her restore her hair, lost due to illness. She adds that she will return to high society, and from now on she needs to participate in many more events. 
The woman reports that any action she takes will now be an excellent advertisement for the hair product. Rebecca suddenly tells the woman that she is very amazing. Adelgate reports that the only one who is truly amazing is the girl herself, after which she shares that it is her great joy to find and invest in new business areas. The woman suggests that the men begin by narrowing down the list of possible alchemical workshops for making the product. They begin to vigorously discuss future plans while the girl stands in complete confusion. The girl sits in her workshop, minding her own business. Carlisle looks into the building after knocking. The guy says they didn't have a chance to exchange greetings today. Suddenly, Rebecca realizes that she messed up a little, so she asks for forgiveness, explaining that she was busy. The Duke is understanding, because he knows that she is working on the greatest invention of their time. Rebecca feels a little shy hearing the guy's praise. She asks him to sit on a nearby chair, informing him that it is clean as she does not use this area. Carlyle takes the designated seat and they sit opposite each other in silence for a moment. She congratulated the guy on his return, breaking the silent pause. Ravenster, smiling, thanks the girl for her congratulations. She asks if he's hurt, and Carlyle says he's fine because he's the country's one and only swordmaster. Unexpectedly, he suggests putting the greetings aside. He says that he wants to sincerely thank the girl. Carlyle says Rebecca was able to give his mom her freedom back. She says she wouldn't call it that grandiose. The girl says that the Duke is too generous with her. Carlyle reports that if it were not for the girl, he would not have known that Adelgate was already better. He admits that he has always felt fear, but their mother apparently does not understand what her children have been through. Duke says Adelgate is absolutely delighted with the new business. Rebecca suddenly asks if the guy is really okay. Carlisle says he doesn't quite understand what the girl means. She admits that she is afraid of tarnishing the reputation of the Rovensters. Carlisle gives her a serious look, telling her that he still doesn't understand. The girl explains that if people find out that she is still practicing alchemy, they will call her a strange lady again. The guy gently puts his hand on her shoulder and tells her that she doesn't need to worry about it. He says that perhaps people will speak unflatteringly about her. The guy ends up saying that in this case, they will simply be jealous of her wonderful invention. Carlyle suddenly says that if they bother the girl, he will do something very bad, which scares Rebecca. He admits that he is more concerned about her family at the moment. The Duke asks if Rebecca is afraid that her family will find out about this. The girl reports that just thinking about what her father and brother will say gives her a headache. The guy says that she shouldn't worry because he and his mother will protect her. The girl asks if she can really succeed. Carlyle says it doesn't matter to him whether she succeeds or not. She asks him what this means, not understanding what he means. The Duke lifts the corners of his lips slightly when he sees her reaction. He says that he will always support her every alchemical endeavor. The girl, touched by his words, looks at him joyfully. Suddenly, something explodes in the workshop, and at that moment, Rebecca throws herself at the Duke. She tries to clear her throat, not understanding what just happened. Several flasks begin to smoke heavily, cracking a little. The girl raises her head slightly to look around. Carlyle looks at her in surprise without saying a word. Rebecca is almost lying on top of him while the guy's hands barely touch her waist. The girl enters the building, greeting Mr. Bischutz. The man asks her not to speak to him so formally, since she is the future Duchess. She says that she is not yet a Duchess, asking to be treated the same as always. Rebecca notices that he is even friends with her father, who himself, technically, is a Count. Bischutz says that Hames always wanted to be treated as an alchemist rather than a nobleman. The girl says that in this she is no different from her father. In the end, the man agrees, after which he says that now he wants to be frank. He says that when he received the offer from the Rovenster family, he could not believe it, because he was very surprised by the fact that the girl continued to practice alchemy, even living with the Duke. Rebecca says Carlyle and his mother are very supportive of her. Bischutz says that he thought that it would be a pity if the girl's talents were wasted. She notices that the man has changed a lot, and he says that he must keep up with the times. Rebecca admits that she didn't quite understand what his answer meant. The man is about to say something, warning that the girl has probably already heard. He announces that he is now completely done with the development of magical weapons. Rebecca says she is aware and also heard that he had his workshop converted exclusively for his personal business. Bishop says that alchemy in its current form has reached a dead end because everyone is investing exclusively in magical weapons and there is no more progress in this area. He reports that during this time they probably missed many great opportunities. The man regrets that he did not realize this earlier because by the time he realized this, 
His workshop was already mired in debt after several unsuccessful projects, so now he can only use his workshop to receive orders. He says he must pay off all his debts before he dies if he wants his son to inherit his workshop. Rebecca agrees with him and says that she can help him. She asks if he could produce her hair growth potion. The man agrees to the proposal, saying that he never thought that being friends with her father would help him so much. He asks if the potion really works and receives a positive answer. The girl says they will have to undergo several safety tests before launching it on sale. Suddenly, Rebecca decides to tell the man something else, but hesitates. She begins to say what will happen if her father finds out about this, but she is suddenly interrupted. Bischutz asks if Haim still knows about this, and the girl nods at him uncertainly. The man understood that if the girl's father found out that she was still practicing alchemy, he would certainly make a fuss. He agrees not to tell Hames about this, saying that he cannot indulge his friend's personal feelings when he is about to die from debt. The girl apologizes and Bishuch asks her not to apologize because thanks to her, his workshop has a bright and long future. The man says that they have to give it their all, also adding that if it becomes a hit, even the girl's father won't be able to say anything. Rebecca is inspired to do this, truly realizing that if her remedy is successful, then her father and the rest of the family may finally recognize her as an alchemist. In addition, the girl always wanted to help people with the help of alchemy. Words pop up in her head that Carlisle doesn't care whether a girl can succeed or not. She blushes deeply, remembering this truly pleasant moment for her. Rebecca remembers him talking about how he would support her every alchemical endeavor. The girl sits in some confusion, blushing more and more. Suddenly, Bishop asks if everything is okay, and she says everything is okay. After that incident in the workshop, she was so ashamed that she simply awkwardly sent Carlisle away. They awkwardly wished each other good night, very nervous. Now Rebecca understands that she should not have created such a big mess, also without doubting that the Duke was completely indifferent to it. There is a lively conversation at the event, but suddenly those present notice something surprising. A dressed-up Adelgate appears in front of them and everyone immediately greets her. She, without moving from her place, greets everyone present. One of the women, Remador, says that she hasn't seen her at the tea party for a long time, and Adelgate notes that they saved a place for her all this time. Remador says that she promised to do this, so she made sure to do it. Adelgate says she's grateful to everyone for not forgetting about her and always sending an invitation. Remador says the woman did much more for her. Adelgate recalls that several years have passed since she announced her retirement in this place. She says that this is the reason why she must announce her return to high society here. Everyone congratulates the woman saying that they are very happy to see her. Someone says that they should definitely thank Artel for this. Suddenly, Adelgate says that there is something she wanted to confess to them. She says she doesn't mind if others find out about it. The woman says that, as they already know, she left high society due to a bad heart, so she did not leave the house to fully concentrate on her health. She says she was eventually cured but lost all her hair due to the side effects of the medications. Rimador sharply says that this should be left only between them, but the woman asks her not to worry. She calmly says that her hair has already managed to grow back. Rimador says it appeared to be a temporary side effect. Adelgate denies this and says her hair has completely fallen out. The woman takes out a bottle of hair growth product and puts it on the table. She says her son's fiance, Rebecca O'Clain, made the potion to make her hair grow back. Everyone looks in shock, first at the woman, then at the potion, not understanding how this could happen. Adelgate says the potion has no side effects and can simply be applied to the head rather than taken orally. Someone asks if her beautiful hair really grew with the help of a potion. Suddenly, the women sitting at the table change their faces, looking seriously at the bottle. They ask if Rebecca can share the remedy with them. Adelgate asks if they really think that she would come to show off empty-handed. She says the effect lasts about ten days, as the instructions say, and then asks them to try it and, if desired, buy more. Rimador asks in surprise if the product is for sale. Adelgate calmly agrees, smiling slightly. On this day, the Rovenster store was to open on the main street and begin selling hair growth products. Tyler tries to squeeze through the huge crowd, which he does very poorly. Suddenly, they announce that the product has just sold out. People start screaming and asking for more to be sold, since they did not have time to buy. Olsen is trying to reassure people who are clamoring for more goods. The commoners ask that the potion not be sold only to the nobles, because they also want to buy it. Charlotte, who has just arrived at the store, looks in surprise at the crowd that has formed around the store. She realizes that they really hit the jackpot. Charlotte enters the building, asking where her mother is. 
The maid says that she has just returned, and the girl notices Adelgate. The woman suggests going to their store together, and Charlotte asks if she really doesn't know what's going on yet. The girl says that they don't have time for such conversations. She reports that people are about to start rioting for a hair growth product. Adelgate is surprised that people started walking along it so quickly, and the footman suddenly tells the woman that she has a message from Olsen. She reads the letter, and it turns out that all the potions were sold out in just an hour. Rebecca is surprised when she hears the same news from Charlotte. She couldn't believe it was actually sold out. Charlotte says that, in the end, there wasn't a single bottle left. What scares Rebecca is that they made a total of 700 bottles and they sold out in just an hour. The girl is congratulated on the fact that her potion is in great demand. Charlotte asks how her mother and girlfriend split the profits. Rebecca says they split it evenly, 50-50, and the girl says that's too much. O'Clain says she knew she was only supposed to get 30 or 40 percent, but Charlotte says she should have kept 60 or 70 percent. Charlotte sighs and says she doesn't have the qualities to be a good businesswoman. She says that this will be her condition anyway. Rebecca asks what she means and she asks if it's obvious. Charlotte says that this money will completely belong to her if she marries her brother, which the girl is very surprised by. She, shyly, says that she is not suitable for such a position. The girl begins to say that the Rovenster family is too prestigious for her. Besides, Carlisle is a great swordmaster, and she is just an ordinary alchemist. Charlotte understood that they still had a lot of time anyway. Carlisle looks forward seriously and asks what this is all about. Adelgate calmly says that these are all bribes from the nobles. The guy is annoyed that they are sending him gifts again, and his mother suddenly tells him that this is not all for him. Carlisle grins and looks at the approaching girl, sarcastically asking who they are really for. The Duke immediately congratulates the girl on her apparent success. The guy advises her to first celebrate her successful result. He adds that they will simply throw away the gifts, to which Charlotte immediately disagrees, having seen the invitations that came to her as well. Carlyle says they should have a private, intimate party once things have calmed down a bit. The Duke suddenly says that it is time for him to go, and they say goodbye. Rebecca realizes that this is the first time they have seen each other since that hug. She decides that Carlyle really didn't feel anything special. Meanwhile, the Duke walks away in the right direction, completely flushed with blush. He clears his throat, trying to get rid of the feelings that wash over him. Carlyle is suddenly met somewhere in the corridor by a guy. More and more guys are coming, and everyone is asking him for some opportunity. The Duke looks in surprise at the noise around him. Guys start talking about bottles of hair growth product. Meanwhile, some of them are already starting to fight, wanting to take the bottle first. The entire crowd begins to put pressure on Carlisle, who does not understand anything. Suddenly he can't stand it and starts laughing, clutching his stomach. After a couple of seconds, he apologizes for his behavior. The Duke explains that he did not think the potion was so popular. Suddenly, a man approaches the guy, informing him that everyone is ready for training. Carlyle says that they will talk later, after which he quickly runs away. A man notices that the guy has been in a pretty good mood lately. The Duke smiles, chuckling slightly when he hears this. He wonders if the man really thinks that way. Judith returns home and is greeted by a footman who greets her. She asks where William is, and the guy says that he is now in his office. Locke suddenly appears in front of the woman, which accidentally scares her. He asks where she was, and she says she was at a garden party. Judith finds the guy's behavior suspicious, so she immediately asks what's wrong with him. Locke whispers that it's better for William not to say anything about Rebecca for now, and the woman is surprised that he has already heard about her too. Judith was the only one who didn't understand anything at the reception, when people started approaching her asking for a hair growth product. The guy says that William probably won't be happy to hear about his sister. Locke says that in addition to this, the man failed another project today to create a new weapon. The woman, hearing this, goes into William's room in a fit of anger. Locke realizes that something very bad is about to happen. Judith bursts into her drunken husband's room, screaming at him that now is not the time to sleep. The man irritably asks what happened, slowly waking up. She says that his sister is becoming a wild success, while he sits here after yet another failure, but William doesn't understand anything. Judith directly tells him that Rebecca has invented a potion for hair growth. She says it's sold in the Rovenster store, and the potion is so popular that people are begging to get their hands on it. William gets up from his seat and asks if Rebecca created the potion. He suddenly starts shouting that the girl should focus on her wedding lessons. Judith says that this is not important now, and each new batch of her potion is sold out in a matter of minutes. Even the nobles are asking to get at least a bottle. The man says that such a lousy potion is no match for the new weapon, 
and she yells at him for saying such a thing even though he failed his project again. She asks how much he spent this time, and William begins to say that as soon as his next invention is successful, everything will be fine. The woman sharply tells him that he needs to do something that will actually sell. The man is angry that she invites him to become a low-grade alchemist who creates meaningless goods. He says that he is a descendant of O'Clain, who once successfully created the Philosopher's Stone, and also the son of Haim O'Clain, the father of weapons, so he is not going to stoop to such baseness. Judith tells him that he's just wasting his family's fortune without making a cent, then asks what's so great about him. She turns around and says she has to go see Rebecca soon. The woman tells him that he has clearly lost, and then leaves him alone. William, standing in the middle of the room, immediately begins to blame Rebecca for everything. It angered him beyond belief that the girl was still practicing alchemy, even on the Duke's estate. The man takes a sheet of paper and a pen, after which he begins to diligently scribble a letter. Having finished writing, he calls the butler, who immediately runs up to his call. He hands the letter to the guy, asking him to send it to Rebecca, and also saying that the girl needs to be brought to some sense. Rebecca carefully reads her older brother's letter. She tells Rosaline that she doesn't sound as angry as she expected. The girl understands that this is not enough for William to recognize her as an alchemist. Afterwards, she reads a letter from Locke, in which he writes that he always knew that their family was wrong, and she really is a genius. He studied her remedy and was very surprised that she had thought of such an extraction of sunrise petals. Rebecca says that Locke is very kind as always, and Rosaline confirms this. The girl, stretching, thinks about what she should do this time. Rosaline doubted that everything was all right with the girl, and she understood that her elder was unlikely to stop at one short letter. For some reason, Rebecca felt that something terrible was going to happen. Regina, turning to Haley, asks if she will really allow this to continue. She was talking about Rebecca and her, in the girl's opinion, strange potion. Regina says she always knew there was something wrong with her, but she didn't think she would turn out to be a fraud. Haley is surprised when she hears that the girl is a fraud. She says that Regina's family made a fortune in the wig business, and she replies that their business is not so shaky that such a scammer could influence it. Regina says they can't let Rebecca keep doing this. The other girls take up this suggestion, asking how she dared to steal Hylmi's place by taking advantage of the Imperial family. Regina did not understand how the Imperial family could insist on Rebecca's betrothal, just because they were against the unity of the two ducal families, the Rovensters and the Cartsius. She says that Duke Rovenster simply had no choice and had to submit to the wishes of the Imperial family. Haley, shedding a few tears, says that she couldn't do anything about the situation either. She reveals that she would like to live quietly for a while to heal her broken heart. Regina says she will definitely teach Rebecca a lesson for her sake. She explains that in a few days, St. Marcetina's Day will take place, which she must attend. Haley says that she doesn't want anyone to bother with her, and the girl reports that she is too soft-hearted. Regina confidently says that she will make sure Rebecca runs away crying. Everyone starts giggling at the sight, thinking one of them's plans are great. Haley, grinning, realizes that Regina has finally come in handy, and vows that Rebecca will soon know what it's like to take her place. Rebecca, meanwhile, is carefully working on some kind of potion, suspecting nothing. Several hundred years ago, the Empire experienced a catastrophe. An evil witch cursed the northern lands, and the curse froze everything under endless snow, causing people to suffer terribly. But then Priestess Marcetina suddenly appeared out of nowhere. She sacrificed her own life to use holy power to destroy the witch's curse. The curse was lifted, but the Priestess Marcetina herself died right on the spot of the battle. In memory of her noble sacrifice, the day of St. Marcetina was created, on which the entire empire organizes a grand celebration. In the main temple, the saint herself blesses the imperial family and nobles, and in the other temples, priests and priestesses bless the people. Naturally, Rebecca must also be present at this sacred ceremony. Suddenly, the saint comes out, a man chosen by the goddess Artel herself. Even the emperor himself cannot command the saint, since she is the pillar of faith of the entire empire. The saint says that on this beautiful day, they all gathered here to honor the memory of Saint Marcetina. She blesses everyone, extending one of her hands to people. Everyone takes the appropriate pose and begins to pray. Rebecca looks at the saint in surprise, distracted from her main task. Carlyle whispers to her that she should pray, and she joins the crowd. Rebecca begins to pray too, closing her eyes tightly. She carefully opens one of her eyes and directs it towards the duke standing nearby. 
The girl asks Artel if their meeting was really part of her plan. Rebecca sincerely thanks Artel for her help, saying that she is incredibly happy every day, after which she promises that she will work even harder. Charlotte annoyedly notices that her mother is late. She says that Carlisle also had to go guard the Emperor. The girl begins to get angry because she is discussing something with the High Priest for so long. Rebecca asks her to wait a little, saying that Adelgate will be back soon. Suddenly, Regina appears in front of the girls, saying that it's time to meet. Rebecca greets the girl, looking at her in surprise. The girl smiles evilly, and then says that she wanted to discuss a lot of things. Charlotte tells her friend that this is Lady Regina, who sent her a couple of invitations. The girl says they never had the opportunity to meet because she kept turning down her invitations. Rebecca says she's been very busy all this time. She still apologizes to the girl for constantly turning down her invitations. Regina asks how busy she must be to not attend any meetings. Charlotte says whether or not to attend meetings is entirely Rebecca's right. Regina apologizes to Charlotte and says that she only wants to chat with Rebecca. The girl says that she is giving the girl the opportunity to improve. She explains that it is about a scam she recently pulled off. Everyone present begins to whisper among themselves. Rebecca angrily asks what she means. Regina says her hair growth product is a scam. Charlotte asks if the girl just called her potion a scam, and she says that even magic and holy power can't cure baldness, so alchemy can't fix it. Rebecca angrily asks why she thinks alchemy can't do this. Regina asks how alchemy can help people if it is used to create deadly weapons. Charlotte asks how dare she say something like that. Rebecca says that you don't have to be a magician or priest to do this. She reveals that anyone can use a magic lamp made through alchemy, and then says that this entire hall is illuminated only because of alchemy. The girl says that anyone can enjoy the facilities provided to her. She declares that this is the power of alchemy. Rebecca asks not to look down on her as something inferior to magic or holy power, because even Regina herself lives more comfortably thanks to her. Charlotte truly admires how much her friend loves alchemy, then assumes that she is the biggest fan on the entire continent. Regina says that she is trading in deception anyway, and because of her there are countless victims. Rebecca furiously asks what victims are we talking about now? The girl says that because of her and her potion, it is now impossible to know who is bald and who is not. Rebecca looks in surprise at the person standing opposite, while the whole room begins to whisper earnestly again. She says that she doesn't understand what the girl is talking about at all. Regina reports that no sane nobleman would want to marry a girl with a bald head. She says that baldness can be inherited and few people would want such a marriage. The girl says that baldness is a defect. And now, because of her potion, bald people will enjoy the same privileges as people with hair. Rebecca says she doesn't think people should be discriminated against because they don't have hair. She adds that everyone is equal in Artel's eyes. And Regina asks her not to act so complacent after she shamelessly stole Haley's position. The girl says that the person standing opposite has no right to talk about equality and she will agree with her arguments only if she herself marries a bald man. She asks the crowd if they want to marry a bald man, would they be ashamed if their child was bald? People start shouting that they don't want bald people in their society. The other half begins to support people without hair, and the crowd is divided into two parts. Regina snaps that the girl's potion caused such a mess. She asks her to look at the conflict that has arisen because of her, asking if she sees how she is dividing the nobles. Suddenly, a woman says that Regina is the only person who divides people, but at the same time puts all the blame on Rebecca. People come out of the crowd and begin to blame the girl, saying that Rebecca is their savior. Suddenly, someone remembers that Regina's family produces wigs designed to hide baldness. The girl says that it was only thanks to her family that they were able to live normally, and someone asks if she is talking about those heavy, uncomfortable, and ridiculously expensive wigs. People start saying that the girl is jealous of Rebecca because her business is failing. Regina abruptly starts yelling that their business will never fail. Suddenly, the girl asks if people really believe that the potion has no side effects, if it was not even certified by House Carcius. She says that all alchemical products must be certified by House Carcius. Haley, watching the whole thing, grins, feeling the taste of victory. Rebecca claims that her potion has no side effects. She says sharply that she shaved her own hair, Regina asks what she just said, not believing her ears. The girl says that she shaved her head to test the potion. She admits that she has shaved her hair as many as five times. Rebecca assures everyone present that the potion has no side effects. Regina decides that the girl is crazy and abnormal. 
Rebecca says she understands that it is customary for alchemists to be certified by House Karshus, but her product is already certified by House Rovenster. She asks if there is a reason why she should receive additional certification from House Karsius. Regina sharply says that there is a reason, because the houses of Rovensteri Karsius cannot be equal. Charlotte suddenly intervenes, asking why they can't be equal. She says that both houses have a ducal title, so she demands to know why they cannot be equal. Regina starts to get nervous trying to find the words. Charlotte asks if she can consider that she is challenging House Rovenster for daring to compare the value of the two duchies. One of the girls sharply apologizes to Charlotte, saying that Regina misspoke. She says that she probably meant that House Cartius knows more about magic and magical objects, since they are a family of magicians. Charlotte asks if she means that she doesn't trust her family's certification because they only know how to use swords. Regina suddenly kneels, saying that what she did was wrong and then asks for forgiveness. Charlotte says that absolutely the whole family has used Rebecca's products. One of the girls, who was previously in league with Regina, says that she trusted the potion from the very beginning. Rebecca was interested in the fact that even Carlisle used her potion. Suddenly, a woman approaches the girl, saying that she has been wanting to talk for a long time. People begin to gather around Rebecca, wanting to talk to her. The saint enters the hall, saying that there has not been such activity here for a long time. Rebecca gets scared when she sees the woman in front of her, and everyone immediately turns their attention to the woman who has entered. The saint assumes that they were carried away by an interesting conversation. Girls approach the saint, explaining that they are talking about a hair remedy, after which one of them offers to explain to the woman what it is. The saint sighs and says that she already knows everything about Rebecca's hair growth product. The girl, hearing this, is very surprised and asks the woman if she really knows about her potion. The saint says that this remedy also helped her temple a lot. She reports that there are quite a lot of hairless children in her orphanage. The woman explains that if a mother cannot eat enough during pregnancy, then her child, most often, loses hair from malnutrition. The saint says that just recently they received an anonymous donation in the form of her potion, and thanks to this, many children now have full hair. Regan understands that he must act, because otherwise Rebecca will conquer everyone. She says the potion only lasts for ten days, so if children lose their hair again after ten days, it will be even more disappointing for them. The saint says that the children know about this, but they still wanted to feel like they had hair, even if only for ten days. The woman says that, thanks to Rebecca, the children have a reason to smile again, and that's something no one can put a price on. Rebecca thanks the saint and promises that once their production stabilizes, she will discuss with Adelgate the possibility of regularly sending donations to the temple. The saint thanks the girl, saying that the children will be delighted. The woman says that in gratitude she will tell Rebecca the prophecy, and everyone present is surprised at this because even the emperor rarely manages to receive a prophecy from the saint, and a simple noble lady has such a chance. The saint says that the hair potion will soon become a great boon for the empire, while Regina realizes that all is lost. The crowd continues to whisper, and Haley, disappointed by this turn of events, turns around and leaves. Rebecca, touched by the saint's kindness, thanks her from the bottom of her heart. The woman wishes her all the best on her chosen path, and then asks her not to hesitate to contact her if she ever needs her help. The saint, smiling, asks the girl to visit her someday. Rebecca looks at her in surprise, not quite understanding why this was said. The saint leaves, and the girl begins to sway from side to side as Charlotte asks if she is okay. Charlotte suggests that she was shocked that Regina suddenly attacked her, then says that it's great that the saint took her side. The girl begins to tremble without ceasing to talk about the saint. Tears of joy appear in her eyes as she fully understands that the saint has supported her. Adelgate, having just heard the story that happened to the girls, only now understands why Rebecca is crying. The girl says that she will never forget this day because she received a prophecy and support from the saint. Charlotte says that the girl has been in this state from the very beginning, and Adelgate imagines how happy she is now. Suddenly, Rebecca feels coldness in her hands, which brings her back to reality. Unexpectedly, the girl decides to raise another topic with Charlotte. She asks if it's true that Carlisle used her product. Charlotte and Adelgate start laughing harshly, and Rebecca decides it was a lie. The girl, trying to calm down, explains that Carlisle himself doesn't know. She says she gave his butler the bottle so he could use it on Carlisle's hair. The Duke entrusts the care of his appearance to the butler, which is why he probably does not know that he is using her hair product. 
The guy's mother and sister say that he probably won't even notice if the butler rubs salt on him. Adelgate says she hopes Rebecca isn't upset about what Regina said. She says that her alchemy is amazing, after which it is against her to not let the words of such people influence her. Rebecca suddenly doesn't understand who Regina is. After a second, she does realize who it is, explaining her forgetfulness by saying that she was struck by the saint. A few days pass and Carlisle approaches his mother, asking why she called him. The woman looks carefully at the guy's hair, trying to notice changes. She says that this is very satisfactory, which embroils the Duke a little in confusion. Adelgate reports that she called the guy because an interesting rumor had spread among the nobles. She says this time it's a little different because the rumor is about Rebecca. According to rumors, Rebecca has the entire royal family behind her, who support her candidacy to be his bride, and she even pushed aside his original bride, Haley. Adelgate reports that moreover, it is said that he admired Haley, but was forced to marry Rebecca due to pressure from the royal family. Carlyle asks if House Cartius is behind this again. Adelgate suggests that this is their way of saving face. The woman says they can't let Rebecca's reputation suffer anymore. Adelgate takes out the invitations and hands them to his son, saying that they should go to the opera together that evening. She seriously says that she asks him to go on a date with her. The woman explains that all the rumors will disappear if they regularly show that they are a happy couple. Carlyle agrees and she says this is a very important moment for Rebecca. Adelgate says that she has finally realized the true value of her talent, and now she needs to rethink her past failures and choose more products that can be commercialized. The woman says that this is an extremely important time for a girl. She tells him that she doesn't want to be bothered by false rumors, so ask her son for help. Adelgate also asks the guy not to tell the girl about the rumors, because then she will probably just say that she doesn't care about these rumors. Carlyle says he understands what the woman is talking about, and then says that he will go to Rebecca. The Duke enters the workshop and realizes that this place never ceases to amaze him. He calls Rebecca, trying not to inhale the smoke that was apparently coming from the girl's new inventions. Rebecca greets the guy in a friendly manner while taking off her gloves. Carlyle asks if he's on time, and the girl tells him not to worry and to come in. He wonders if she's been busy lately, and Rebecca reveals that she needs to think about her next product, so she's been looking through her old projects. The guy remembers how Adelgate told him that she was now at a very important moment. Carlyle tells the girl that she has soot on her face. Rebecca cannot figure out exactly where, and the Duke offers her his help. He carefully wipes the soot off her face with his handkerchief. Having finished wiping away the soot, Carlyle smiles slightly at the girl. Rebecca looks at the guy in surprise, not expecting something like this. He notices that his mother and sister have high hopes for the girl, and she says that they probably overestimate her. She communicates that she wants to live up to their expectations as much as possible, because they are very kind to her. Carlyle asks if the girl will give him a chance to be nice to her. Rebecca looks in surprise at the invitation suddenly extended to her. Some time passes and already on the spot Carlyle notices that he is a little embarrassed because it seems that the butler overdid it. Rebecca suddenly runs up saying that she didn't mean to keep him waiting. The guy looks at her in surprise, admiring her next outfit. He suddenly comes to his senses and decides to smile at the girl in greeting. The guy says that she came just in time after which he suggests they go. Rebecca starts to walk, but suddenly her foot falls out of her shoe. She asks for forgiveness and says that she wears heels rather harshly. Carlyle sits down on his knee and straightens the girl's slipped shoe. Rebecca looks at him in surprise, not expecting such actions from him. The guy, having finished adjusting his shoe, reports that he is finished. The Duke says that if she finds it difficult to walk on them, she can lean on him. The girl's heart begins to beat rapidly, which confuses her greatly, but the feeling also reminds her of the moment she was able to cut her own mana stone for the first time. Already sitting in her seat, Rebecca asks why they are at the opera if he doesn't really like it. The guy, hearing this, looks at the girl in surprise and at the same time seriously. He notices that the girl already knows him well enough, after which he tells her that she is right. The Duke says he doesn't like opera and doesn't even remember the last time he went to see it. He reports that when his mother gave him tickets, he thought that the girl would not mind going. Rebecca tells him that next time he doesn't have to force himself to do something he doesn't like. Carlyle is pleasantly surprised that the girl has already thought about next time and then suggests that they find something the two of them would enjoy on their next date. All the people sitting nearby whisper to each other and discuss the visit of the Duke and his bride. Carlyle, thinking about something, looks seriously at the girl. 
Suddenly, he tucks her hair behind her ear so it doesn't cover her face. He tells the girl that her hair is tangled, trying to explain his behavior. Rebecca suggests that the moments when people react to the Duke's every move are very exhausting, and the guy is glad that at least someone finally understands how he lives. The girl says that it feels like people have come to watch them rather than the opera, and Carlyle says that they will focus on the stage once the opera starts. She sniffs her wine and notices that it smells a little strong, but hopes it's not too bad. Rebecca tries the drink and realizes that it is still terrible. Suddenly, she changes her mind, deciding that the aftertaste is quite pleasant. Carlyle watches with fascination as the girl's expression changes every second. He suddenly starts chuckling, no longer able to hold back his smile. It is announced on stage that the opera will tell the story of a nobleman's love story. In the story, a young lord from a noble family lost his memory after an accident, but he continued to live, receiving care from commoners. Over time, he gradually regained his memory and healed his tired heart. Of course, he also fell in love with a beautiful commoner. The story of a love that transcended the boundaries of social status and a nobleman who passed through the life of a commoner was bound to become popular, regardless of the time. But alas, this was not what Rebecca would like. The girl looks tiredly at the stage, not understanding how this could be interesting. The actor takes his final pose, signaling that intermission has begun. Everyone present stands up from their seats and begins to clap vigorously. Carlyle invites the girl to get some fresh air outside while they have time before the start of the second act, and she agrees. They stand calmly on one of the balconies, enjoying the slightly cool breeze. The Duke unexpectedly asks if she really didn't like the opera much, which surprises the girl. He says that he also found the opera quite boring. The guy reports that this is probably because he did not choose which opera to go to. Rebecca asks if his mother gave the Duke tickets, and he, answering yes, says that she really loves romantic operas, although you can't tell at first glance. Carlyle says that when his father was still alive, they were the happiest couple. The girl laughing notes that their parents are quite similar. The two of them calmly look into the distance, without saying a word. The guy says that the opera is not very interesting, so he suggests that she go home. Rebecca abruptly announces that they need to show the other nobles that they are on good terms. Carlyle instantly agrees, saying that he'll agree if the girl really wants it. The guy suddenly asks her if she likes the local wine. The girl says not really, then remarks that she loves wine in general, and if there's one thing she loves as much as alchemy, it's wine. The Duke reports that he himself loves wine and rarely drinks any other alcohol. Unexpectedly, she asks what his favorite wine is then, and he replies that he has not yet found something similar. Rebecca says her favorite wine is Desert Dawn, which she only tasted once, but it was unforgettable. The guy asks if this is wine made from grapes, but grown in the desert. They begin to talk about how they were introduced to wine, but are distracted from the conversation by the beginning of the second act. After the opera is over, they carefully get into the carriage, preparing for the long journey. Carlyle notices that the girl looks tired, and she says that this opera was really boring. He says that he heard how popular it is, but now there is a traffic jam of carriages, so it will take a long time until they get home, after which he suggests continuing their conversation about wine. Rebecca reveals that she started drinking wine because of alchemy, which does not surprise the person sitting opposite her. She says that she believes that alchemy is her destiny, after which, continuing the story about wine, she says that there were days when she could stay up all night in order to complete her research. The girl says that she once thought that if she drank wine at night, like her father, then she would be able to concentrate better on work, and that's when it all started. Carlyle is surprised because most people feel sleepy when they drink, and Rebecca says that it's the other way around for the O'Clain people, adding that Rosaline secretly brought her a light wine that day, and after that the girl fell in love with this drink. The guy says that even if he seems strong now, in his youth he was often sick. Carlyle, hearing the girl sigh, says that it is indeed true. He says that one day they brought him warm wine so that he could take it as medicine. According to him, after becoming a swordmaster, wine became his best nighttime friend, explaining that he often has trouble sleeping due to his heightened senses. Rebecca says it was a lot of fun, then announces that the wine is the best. She, about to say goodbye, amiably wishes the Duke good night. The girl starts to leave, but Carlyle's voice suddenly calls out to her from behind. The guy begins to direct her in an unknown direction, saying that she will really like it there. The doors open in front of the girl and she sees a dazzling light in front of her. 
she sees hundreds of precious bottles filled with drinks in front of her. Carlisle explains that this is the wine cellar of the Rovenster family. He takes one of the bottles in his hand, and Rebecca, looking at it with admiration, is very surprised. The Duke confirms her guesses and says that this is the dawn of the desert. He asks if the girl would like to have a drink with him in his room. Rebecca looks around the guy's room in fascination, realizing that this is her first time here. Carlisle, meanwhile, realizes that she is the first girl he invited to his room. She remarks that this is quite surprising, and the guy asks what exactly she means. The girl says that she imagined his room to be larger and more luxurious, and Carlisle explains that the Duke's chambers are in another room, and he rarely uses them. He reports that he has already tried to change his room several times, but in none of them did he feel as comfortable as in this one. Rebecca is about to ask why he needs to change the room several times, when suddenly she understands what's what. Charlotte told her that sometimes women would sneak into her brother's room in the middle of the night. He reports that after the demonstrative punishment of one of these troublemakers, the situation has become much better, and the girl is bothered by the fact that this is still happening. Carlisle invites the girl to finally start drinking. Suddenly, the girl stops him as he is preparing to open the bottle and asks him to let her open the bottle herself. The Duke looks at her in surprise, amazed at this behavior. She sharply says that she knows that according to the rules of decency, a man must open a bottle of wine. Rebecca reports that she would really like to discover the desert dawn on her own. The guy hesitantly agrees with the girl's request, after which he asks her to start opening it. Suddenly, Carlyle asks her not to tell his mother about this. He says that he would not like to listen to her regret that she could not raise a true gentleman out of him. And the girl sharply says that Adelgate raised the best son in the world since he is a master of the sword. Rebecca finally finishes opening the bottle, so she begins to fill her lungs with the much-coveted aroma. She, ready to die of happiness, says that the aroma of the wine is simply divine. The girl says that one day her father was given a bottle of this wine. Rebecca says that it was with you that she dreamed of one day opening a bottle of this particular wine, after which she reports that she is incredibly happy. Carlyle asks if the girl will allow her the honor of pouring the first glass. She swirls the drink in her glass, admiring its color. The Duke admits that this is his first time tasting Desert Dawn, and then says that his father really liked the wine. He adds that this is why, after his death, Adelgate collected as many bottles as she could, and Rebecca suddenly feels ashamed for drinking this wine. The guy says that if she tells a woman that she likes wine, she might as well give them her entire wine wardrobe. They confidently clink their glasses, deciding to drink for the two of them. Suddenly, they begin to simultaneously drink the drink almost to the very bottom. Rebecca chuckles slightly, looking at her interlocutor. She says that she is incredibly happy now, and the guy says that the wine definitely deserves all the girl's praise. The Duke reports that he now understands why she and his father were his admirers. They begin to talk cheerfully and casually over a glass of light wine. Unexpectedly, Carlyle says that in the second act of the opera, the girl looked quite serious. He says it doesn't seem like it's just opera-related. The guy persistently asks if anything is still bothering her. Suddenly, she addresses him by name, seriously sighing. She sheepishly asks if the Duke has liked anyone before. While the guy chokes on his wine after hearing what he heard, she says that she knows that he had to go through a lot because of his insane popularity among girls. She suggests that he may have also been harassed by several strange women. Rebecca says that he has probably met worthy ladies before. Carlyle reports that he doesn't think he's felt that way about anyone. The girl notices that she is the same because she has never loved or fallen in love before. She asks the guy if he thinks they are weird because of this. Carlyle says he asked himself this once. Duke suggests that the reason he can't like anyone is because of the people who tormented him, before adding that he also thought about the fact that he was only using them as an excuse to get away from the problem. Rebecca says that in the opera they saw, the main character gave up everything for his love, and then says that she is unlikely to ever give up alchemy for someone. She admits that she only entered into this contract because she did not want to let go of her passion for alchemy. The girl says she wonders if she could one day give up alchemy for the one she loves. Carlyle says maybe she will, maybe she won't. He reports that instead of being hung up on a person who forces her to choose one or the other, he would really like the girl to fall in love with someone who can also protect. Rebecca says the idea of loving someone who can also protect what she holds dear sounds wonderful. The guy says he always drank alone, but it's more fun with company, and the girl asks if she was too serious when she drank. Carlyle says that even if they are under a contract, they can still share their innermost thoughts, 
and Rebecca says that now he should do the talking. The Duke tries to start, but hesitates greatly, unsure of whether to say it. He admits that he actually wanted to ask the girl something. Rebecca enthusiastically tells him that he can safely ask. The guy says that this is a rather awkward question, but the girl says that everything is fine. The Duke admits that maybe it was because he was used to women constantly hanging on to him, but he admired her attitude towards him as an ordinary person. Rebecca looks at him kindly, trying not to miss a word. He suddenly asks if she really doesn't feel anything for him. The girl looks at him in surprise, not expecting to hear such a question. Carlyle watches her seriously, waiting for her to voice her answer. 